Speaker, speaker, Zenny, speaker. Am I on? Good afternoon. Welcome to the June 14th Governance and Priorities Committee meeting. I'd like to first recognize that we are on the traditional territory of the Sunamook First Nation. Our clerk today is Ms. Sheila Gurry. Today's Governance and Priorities Committee meeting will be held in accordance with the Community Charter Council Procedure Bylaw 2018 number 7272 and Ministerial Order number M192 governing open meetings during a state of emergency and the Provincial Health or Officer Order regarding gathering and events. Therefore, members of the public are required to observe meetings virtually and not attend in person and question period will be suspended throughout the duration of the Provincial Health Orders in effect. So first on the agenda is introduction of late items, Ms. Gurry. Thank you, Madam Chair. For late items today, we have an addition of a PowerPoint presentation titled Bylaw and Policy Renewal Project Update, and that goes with item 6B1 on your agenda. As well, the agenda item 4A, minutes for the May 31st, 2021 Governance and Priorities Committee. We're replacing with the amended handout to note to section 5B1, Councillor Martman, regarding permanent recreation vehicle accommodation. And that's it, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, motion for adoption of the agenda is amended. Moved by Councillor Hemmons, second by um, Mayor Crow. All those in favor, motion passes. Motion for adoption of the minutes as circulated. Moved by Councillor Thwart, seconded by Mayor Crow. All those in favor, motion passes. So first, number five, agenda planning, and Ms. Sheila Gurry. Thank you again, Madam Chair. So for today's Governance and Priorities Committee agenda planning, the matrix, the, G the Governance and Priorities Committee matrix, as well as upcoming GPC items are on pages 12 through 18 of your agenda. I just want to note on July the 12th GPC, so that's two meetings from now, we will be going through the priorities again and um, having council revisit the priorities and the status of where we are with your current priorities and um, amending it as you see fit. So there's nothing today unless any councillors have anything to add. And I don't see any speakers, so I'll move on to number six, reports. 6A, reimagine re Nanaimo, and it will be introduced by Mr. Dale Lindsay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as you uh, mentioned, we're here to uh, provide our regular update on reimagine, and I'm gonna turn it over in a minute to Ms. Bhopal Singh. Uh, but I did wanna note that the uh, title of the report talks about scenario workshops, and really is to update council about this going into phase two, our public engagement. Uh, but we do want to spend a little bit of time today um, just going over that, what we're calling the preliminary set of indicators. I know we've, I think it was May 10th, we were last in front of you to review those, but we want to spend some time th today, Ms. Bhopal Singh will walk you through the attachments in the report uh, to get any feedback uh, from the committee uh, so we can uh, move forward um, with any changes that are required. So I'll turn it over to Ms. Bhopal Singh. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council. So if I could get the first slide in the presentation, please, in the PowerPoint. Thank you. Okay, so today, as Mr. Lindsay noted, we are going to go through uh, an overview of the workshop we did on May 31st. Uh, and as part of that, we're also going to be reviewing the indicators that were last before you, uh, not only at that workshop, but also on May 10th, when you had a report before you. And we realized that we didn't get a motion from council at the time that went with that report. And so spending a bit of time with you to clarify what are the indicators we need going forward. So I'll get into that in a little bit more detail. And then we also want to update you on our public engagement strategy for phase two. So next slide, please. Oh, 
Oh, do I? Oh, sorry. Talking. Ms. Bhopal Singh, there, yeah, do, there's a um, clicker there for you. Thank you. Thank you. My apologies, Council. Okay. So this is, as I mentioned, with the exception that we're going to go over the indicators in part of the first part of the agenda here. So we are in phase two, as you know, of the reimagined process where we are taking all the information that we got during phase one and working through different scenarios that you have supported us with as the executive committee on reimagine or the steering committee. And uh, we are also on track, we hope to go through to phase three with actually developing plans. So we thought it was important to show you where we're heading. Uh, you endorsed the terms of reference that included integrating a whole range of city strategies um, with the OCP as an umbrella, our Parks, Recreation, Culture Action Plan, Climate Action Plan, and Active Transportation Plan. So this, doc, this image here is to show you what that looks like going forward and what we're hoping to do by pulling together all the different policies that form an integrated city plan. And so you'll see the four key ones there. And then having supporting documents, including key strategy documents that you've already endorsed, like the economic development strategy, uh, the water supply strategy that's running parallel and also integrated with this process. And then we also have, uh, very importantly, our existing neighborhood plans that are important guiding documents that we continue to use. So just showing you in this, uh, looks like half an orange, how that fits with the overall integrated city plan. And then we've also mentioned action implementation plans. So with some of the plans like climate action, parks, recreation, culture, and active transportation, there are policies, high-level policies that belong in strategic direction, like a city plan. And then there are actual implementation pieces. And by having implementation plans that are synced with those higher-level policies, it would allow us to um, and I think Council has endorsed us using a framework to evaluate. Uh, I don't think I know, and including using the donut economics theory, looking at that and tweaking those implementation plans every two or three years to make sure that we are achieving the overall goals of the broader city plan through them. So I'm just wondering if there's any questions about that, but just, just give you a sense of where we anticipate coming back to you with final documents for review and endorsement and what we're seeing that framing up has right now. So currently, um, we have all these separate plans and integrating them into one and making sure there's synergies. So one good example is the Active Transportation Plan, OCP, and Parks and Recreation Culture Plan all deal with trails in some manner or another, or mobility, and have different versions of maps because they've been done over time. So this is by integrating that particular strategy, we end up with one in sync map and also policies that are aligned and makes it easier for developers, makes it easier for staff, it makes it easier for community members to know what to expect. Um, so I'm just wondering if you have any questions around where we think we're framing things up at this point. At this point, I don't see anybody requesting to speak. Okay, great. <clears throat> Okay, so these are the key community input themes that came out of phase one. So just a reminder of those priorities that we got through some very extensive feedback from the community. I won't read them all out. You've seen them before in different documents. And for the community, they're summarized in our phase one engagement report that's available online. Okay, a reminder of the uh, Nanaimo donut and what that looks like for us and the framework that we're using based on this to um, flesh out our goals and our indicators for evaluating different options as the community involves different scenarios. So we've got five draft strategic goals. These build on existing goals that we have and take it a step further. So using the framework, you can see we've got this overarching Green, a green Nanaimo with resi resilient and regenerative ecosystems, a healthy Nanaimo, community well-being and livability, a connected Nanaimo, equitable access and mobility, an empowered Nanaimo, diversity, culture and social integrity, and an enabled Nanaimo, economic prosperity. 
So this is probably a good point at which to have a review of the different indicators that we have discussed with you and get your endorsement of them going forward. So with that, I'm going to be a, perhaps a legislative nightmare by asking for the image of the donut to be pulled up. The first page would be a green Nanaimo resilient and regenerative ecosystems. Thank you, pardon. Oh, it's attachment B in the report for council's reference. So you actually have that. And I think you also have an 11 by 17 on your table as well. So let's see, I'm not sure I'm able to zoom in, but this image here, if we could start off on the top left-hand corner, that would be wonderful. And for council, so what we've got here is the outer circle of the donut where we've framed up our indicators. And even prior to you directing us to use the donut as our sustainability framework, these are indicators, the types of indicators we would be measuring. And some of you will be familiar from the regional district and from even measures we've used before. And the donut economics frameworks and emphasize that start with what you've got. Uh, with the acknowledgement that measuring indicators can be expensive, it can be uh, a tricky process. So look at what you've got, what's reliable, start off with that, and then start tweaking as you go. Now our goal today is to ensure that we have a preliminary set of indicators so that as we are evaluating the different options for growth, that we have indicators that help us, uh, both the community and yourselves as the steering committee on this project, evaluate which of the different growth or scenarios uh, meet or may better meet some of these indicators that we've got today. So what you see up here is water resources um, and the draft indicator there is water consumption by residents. Uh, you've also got household and land household waste. Uh, this is one that these two have been measured and we have extensive data going back years in terms of baselines. Um, soil and waterway health, again, that's a water quality one, and uh, ocean health. And you can see in the bottom two on your sheet that the same indicator helps show um, measures toward, towards progress with both soil and waterway health as well as ocean health. So one of the things I, I wanted to point out is uh, we had our indicators workshop with you on March 10th. And uh, what you had with staff pulling together what information we had, evaluating what we thought were the um, most prudent approaches to using the indicators um, available to us, where we knew that they'd be reliable, cost effective, and available in a timely manner, so measured in a frequent enough time that, and most of all is that the indicators were uh, things that we could influence in terms of their outcomes. Uh, so that was a key piece. So I'm just wondering if you have any comments about these indicators before I move on to any others, or if you'd like me to go through them all and then discuss at the end what would be council's preference. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious, under water resources, the draft target, a new target to be set as the previous target was exceeded, is that, that means that we're, we're doing well? Okay. Yes, that okay. means we're doing well. Okay. I wasn't sure okay. if that went the other way and no. we needed to reevaluate. Okay, yeah. thank you. Councillor Brown also has a question as well. Um, Chair, Madam Chair, I don't think your mic was on, so I'm not sure if Councillor Brown oh. heard you address him. Councillor Brown. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, through you, Ms. Bopalsing. I'm just curious on the household waste sent to landfill um, with some changes in how we will be hopefully accounting. through the chair to Councillor Brown. I think I caught most of that. Um, and that was 
that could this indicator be expanded to include multifamily and other available data uh, when it comes online? Is that correct? Okay. And, and the answer would be yes. But right now, this is what we currently have. And so as we're able to both monitor, measure, and uh, allow for that, uh, this is an example of where indicators as information becomes available and reliable to us, where it can be added at a future stage in the monitoring progress, process. Thank you. Yes, Councillor Hammonds. Thank you, Chair. Um, regarding soil and waterway health as well as ocean health, so we're- Councillor Hammonds, I don't believe your microphone is on or working. Mm -hmm. Is it just my voice again? Oh, that was big. No, it's um, working. Thank you. So the number of water samples at monitored sites meeting BC water quality guidelines, we're looking to reduce the number of samples that fail for both soil and waterway as well as ocean. What, what levers can we pull to, to actually manage that? Or is that just we hope that you know collectively everyone is doing well and we're going to see reduced numbers, or do we actually have a role in, in this? Okay, through the Thank chair you. to Councillor Hammonds. Oh, by the way, before I say that, Council, through the chair, I think Councillor Bonner had a question that wasn't, okay. Thank you. So through responding to Councillor uh, Hammonds, yes, this is somewhere where we do have an influence. So for example, we have uh, measures where we require different things like oil water separators, on-site management of rainwater, and a number of things related to our land use regulation that influence um, soil and waterway health. Now, there are other ministries that have a role as well, but this is one where we do have an influence. Thank you. And Councillor Bonner and then Councillor Turley. Nope. Okay, Councillor Bonner. <clears throat> It actually, through the chair, it actually does come on instantly, um, apparently, so I think you can speak right away. Um, well, so um, my, my question here is, is, is less about the actual specifics, it's more about the generalities of how the, mm -hmm. the, don the donor concept works. Uh, because a lot of times I'm, I'm reading these things and I'm seeing a, a one line marker and, and I was having a conversation with uh, my dearest friend over there, Ben, uh, early, late, late last night on this thing. And to me, that is just a very thin line, probably somewhere in the middle of the donut. But I'm more interested in, in where do we, in what area can, a latitude do we have to be in there? So like, if, the, if we're looking at the, that water consumption of 260 liters per day uh, per person is good, then what would be bad and what would be super good? Um, in, in, if I can be so you know, coarse in that, is, is, is where do we start um, looking at these, these, these um, dividers and saying, okay, now we actually have to do something about it. It was going along just fine, and now it's actually crossed the line, either up or down, and now we have to actually start influencing again, um, or continue or do more sort of thing. So how do we figure those out? Because if we, if we say our indicator is 206 liters per capita per day, and next year all of a sudden we're doing 210, do we start doing stuff or do we say, no, that's still within our norm, we're fine, um, that sort of thing. That's, I'm kind of curious in how that part of it works. Okay, through the chair to Councillor Bonner, that's an excellent question. This is something where as we monitor and come back to Council, I would anticipate that the different departments who have uh, supported or provided these indicators would give you a, a number of things in terms of what's good for Nanaimo, how we compare across other municipalities in terms of what is expected as a good level or threshold up and down. Um, so I can't give you an answer right now on the water one, for example, but I would be relying on Mr. Sims and his team to come back to council and say, okay, you know, this is the trend we're seeing. We're moving in the right or wrong direction. Here's what we support tweaking. Um, and here's how we could do that and what we think the impact would be. Um, and, and if I may, um, 
further to that is how do we use this information to make decisions going forward? And I'll, I'll, I'll mention the dam because we're talking about water here. So um, what do we need to do to say we don't want to build a dam? And I'm just throwing this out as, as generalities, that, that we decided that we do not want to build another dam or increase the size of our existing dam. What do we have to do as a city to keep us within that donut, and I, I see Mr. Sims is coming down, <laughs> and to keep us within that donut if that is our decision not to build a dam. Like if our decision is to build a dam, mm -hmm. then where are we staying within that? Like, because then the, the outer and inner planners would change at that point, I'm thinking. Um, through the chair to Councillor Bonner before I turn over to Mr. Sims, this is an example of one where you've got a couple of things to think about. One is your existing population at the time that you're measuring, and then your future population. So one thing that Council will be aware of is that we had a demographic analysis done that predicts an additional up to 40,000 people in the next 25 years. So balancing that per capita with the overall water consumption would be a factor. And with that, I'll turn over to Mr. Sims, but that broader picture whether it's this indicator or others, whether it would be, I'd see each department coming back and providing council with the pros, cons, and options to evaluate and tweak. And this is part of what you directed us to do as part of having a monitoring and implementation program. So, Mr. Sims. Madam Chair, uh, to Councillor Bonner's point, I think th this is a really, really good discussion, but some of it's not so black and white all the time. It depends on the year, depends on the weather. This, you know, we see our revenues drop in a wet year and, and increase in a dry year. Mm -hmm. Same with consumption. Um, it's more about observing the trend and <clears throat> understanding, sort of continually improving our understanding for the uh, ability of the environment to, to absorb or withstand or, or carry, I guess is the right word, um, the water that we're using. So far, we've had a very robust water system. Um, the the trend that we're we're seeing, you know, this started 15 years ago at about uh, over 450 or something liters per person per day uh, in the in the residential market. So we've we've cut that in half, which is remarkable. And as long as we can continue to see that general trend, it's not going to be year by year. You mentioned 210. If we bounce up, that's not a, a cause to panic. It's just a cause to, do we need to elevate our level of instruction? Do we need other, other measures that we apply? But it's over that sort of generation, generational kind of um, effort, the 25 years of 40,000 people. Mm -hmm. I hope that helps. That's, that's an example, but I think that's applicable to many of the other uh, indicators as well. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Armstrong. Well, thank you. Just a couple questions if I may. One of my concerns is this is now not an official community plan in my mind. This has become a council driven plan and I've got a lot of concerns about that and that's what I'm hearing from many people that you know we've developed this plan and we're putting it out to the community. We don't even know if this is a plan that the community wants. So one of my questions will be when we are doing the uh, community engagement next phases when we let's say we look at water resources are we going to have a say, is this a, a tick box? Is this important to you? Yes or no? If so, is this reasonable? Like in all of those, like in, in going down to um, a healthy Nanaimo. The, the, the biggest issue coming to me right now is the lack of doctors. I don't see that any place. Like, I mean, I think my concern is the official community plan is supposed to be what the community wants, not what council wants. And I feel that we're really getting off track with this. I was just reading what happened in Ottawa where the same thing is coming forward, where they're even actually looking at a court case there, because it's not about what the community wants, it's what the council wants, and I understand that, but I believe that we do all that through our strategic priorities and stuff. So I just want to know how we even, even put a question on there. Is the donut, donut economic model one that's endorsed by the city, you know, for going that way? Because if we don't get reelected, there's a chance that whole model could be gone. And if we're basing an official community plan on a, one type of model, and it's changed by an incoming council, does that change the whole official community plan? I guess that's my, my first question. Okay. Um, I'm wondering who that is to, Councillor Armstrong. The universe. 
Ms. Paul Singh as she's leading it. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, through the chair to Councillor Armstrong, I, having seen the amount of feedback that we got in phase one and how we used that to create the goals, um, while yes, Council did give us direction to use and integrate the donor economics framework into Reimagine, um, I will say with all due respect, there are so many elements of the donut that were already embedded in our existing plans that we've built on and built on from the community's input from 2008. And we have yet to present the community or yourselves with a draft plan. And so what we're really hoping is that with phase two, as we go out to the community with different options for how the city evolves, that the community has that opportunity to both endorse the draft goals and the different scenarios and how, what, and the implications related to that. So I, I, I do respectfully think that, that um, Council, through your, our extensive engagement in phase one and what we hope will be extensive engagement in phase two, uh, has heard the community, is hearing the community, will continue to hear the community and others through this process. Um, I think that's the best answer I can give right now. Thank you. Like, I think all the goals are, are really uh, commendable, and I think most people are going to agree with it. But I just think it would be really important to know that if we are on the right track with that. Thank you. Thank you. I guess through the chair to Councillor Martman, we are hoping for you to give us some feedback on the phase two engagement, which is our opportunity to check in with the community to see if what we've got before you today uh, makes sense. Thank you. My speakers isn't working here so well, so <laughs> you might need to lift up your hand if you wish to speak. Councillor Hemmings. Thank you, um, Chair, and I just want to address Councillor Armstrong's comments about access to physicians. And my understanding of the donut and, and what we're trying to do is that we're only going to measure things that we actually have the ability to impact, and the city is not involved in recruiting physicians. Unless we want to go out and start doing that work, we shouldn't be putting it in our plan. but what we're focusing on is what is completely within our remit um, so that's my understanding thank you thank you uh, thank you chair um, I'll stay back a little bit I, I just want to come back to something councillor Bonner said around the water consumption and and this is the one that always troubles me and and I'll bring in the issue of food security if everybody with a single family dwelling in a lot in this town were not watering their grass, but watering their garden, we might indeed see an increase in water consumption. But overall, I would argue for the health of the planet, it's a good thing because we're eating food growing closer to home. Uh, the other thing is, I mean, as Mr. Sims has pointed out, we've generally had a very good record, but are we doing a better job or is it because many of us are living in condominiums now and we don't have a lawn to water or a garden patch or whatever? I mean, this is, this is why the statistical stuff always gets so incredibly tricky, I think. Um, I'm just thinking if we can continue to reduce water consumption, period, we're going in the right direction, uh, which is positive because it means less infrastructure, as you pointed out. Maybe we can make a decision about not building the dam. Uh, and, and with respect to Councillor Armstrong's concerns, I mean, we're in the early stages. That's, that's the point of this discussion is to allow not just Council, but for the, uh, the community to, to comment on this. But uh, let's also be blunt, at the end of the day, we're the ones who are going to be voting on it. Mm -hmm. It's our decision. I hate to say it. I don't mean that in, a, in, a, in an arrogant way. I mean, it is our decision. We will be approving that plan. Uh, and so it... Uh, uh, we, un, un, fortunately or unfortunately, we have a long ways to go yet, and, and staff has done an incredible job moving this forward as they have uh, through COVID times, which mercifully appear to be ending. But to my comments for the day, thank you. And I just want to say, if I put the green mic on, does that show up on your list that I wish to speak? No. no. Nothing is showing up. It might be because I'm not actually there. Uh. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just uh, also wanted to pick up on a, because I think it's a fundamental piece of the process that we're under here. Councillor Armstrong's comment about Council's plan. 
uh, this is this is you know you could have had a task force set up to deal develop the, the drafts and that type of thing with making recommendations. In this case, it was decided to, to have council be the steering committee. So you're simply putting materials together and endorsing them for conversation and comment. So it's you've been put into place for that criticism, I suppose. But it's really your your job is to really prepare materials for for uh, public comment now. Part of that was uh, was presented at the last meeting. I believe there were two or three options for land use layouts and that type of thing in the city. This is fundamentally a major thing, and a big part of what you're doing is the, the groundwork. This is an OCP and other plan update. This tool that's being used with the donut is is a vehicle to try to quantify and align things so we know how you're performing as a city. So it's not an exercise in implementing the donut, though that is part of this. This is really an exercise to refresh our documents. These are foundational documents that are going to lead us into the 2030s. I was just thinking here this morning. So they're going to be around for a while. And I think you can always update your, your uh, performance indicators and that type of thing. So this is not just, but this is the, at this time, I think you're going through the process of identifying and figuring out how these indicators and how the donut does fit into this exercise. So uh, it's, it's bleeding edge and it's, it's not necessarily going to be perfect. And what Ms. Bull Paul Singh said is what we've primarily done is taking the indicators that are already in the system in these documents and you're updating those and aligning those with the work that's going on. So I don't think Council's done anything wrong and, and one of the great things about having workshops like this is it gets you the opportunity to get your head around this and have these conversations early on in the system such that when you get to when you have the draft plan later on you will have had a narrative that uh, helps you and maybe hopefully the community understand how this fits together. So I think Council is entirely you may end up with a four-hour meeting today to go over this, but that's good work because if it saves you time later on, it's good. That's all my comment. Thank you. Apparently, I can't log in. It says unable to log in, so I can't get on your list. Maybe Sounds like my microphone is working, so yeah. yes, Would I'll use like my hand. I'll use my hand to, to call for the uh, technical experts that set up the system. Would you like to? Um, yeah, I will. Thank you now that I've got your attention. Before we move on, uh, I, I absolutely respect the work of Ms. Bhopal Singh and, and staff in, in this huge project, but I do think that Councillor Armstrong makes a, a very valid point, and I think it's one of the main challenges that I see as we move into uh, the coming phases. We don't want to be seen as driving the public towards a predetermined uh, end goal. Uh, we want to be genuinely receiving um, opinions from the public. So yes, we're putting, we're putting some things out there, but I think it's very important that we stress that this is not council's uh, plan. This needs to be a public plan, and we, we really want to hear from the public. So uh, I know that's the intent, uh, but I think that needs to be stressed, and I think everybody in the public needs to hear that. Thank you. Through the chair to Councillor Thorpe, we'll make sure that that is thoroughly emphasized in the phase two communication and our terminology, the city plan. We hope people see that they are the city and it is a wider document that way. Um, and uh, I might just request with IT, I don't seem to be able to forward to the next slide. <laughs> okay, and if I could go to the next one again. Okay, so again, a quick look at the top right corner of your green and resilient goal. We've got air quality. Uh, we're acknowledging with this one it, that this is monitored hourly at the provincial level. And again, this is one that, yes, we do have it in there. We do have an influence on air quality when it comes to land use, uh, but we're not as directly, for example, um, and also with the greenhouse gas emissions, that's another element in which we influence, but it is the province that monitors that. So that makes our life quite easy because they provide us with that data. Uh, with biodiversity, this is, um, so our ecosystems are healthy and cared for. We've got a draft indicator of the area of land dedicated for natural areas. So our parks and recreation and culture number one zoning, 
Um, so looking at that, and we've got a baseline for that, and maintaining that and potentially increasing that would be where we hope to go. And then the other, the next indicator you've got there is chemical pollution. So our lands are and waters are healthy and sustainable. And you'll see that that's the same target, uh, the same indicator that we've got for soil and waterway health and also ocean health. So again, this is something where we have a role through our land use and our other policies related to that. Um, and that, that speaks to that chemical pollution side of the donuts. Okay. Then we've got for climate change, a fairly standard one across all municipalities, which is looking at our GHG or greenhouse gas emissions. And the targets are those that you've already endorsed uh, in your time. And we have data available for that. And then the next one, we've got land use and land health. And that is similar to the one above uh, for biodiversity. So you can see that using um, one indicator may tell us progress towards one or more goals. And so what we've done here is we've done what some other areas have done with their donut, or whether it's not a donut, it's another framework for monitoring. Uh, because the intent here is to have a preliminary set of indicators that isn't so big that we never get to it every year and we can manage it with our staff resources. And if those of you who are at the RDN, if you speak to their staff there, they will tell you that monitoring is no small feat and they spend a lot of staff time and resources doing that. So it's balancing that need to keep it manageable so that we can come back to council with information in a way that makes sense so that you can tweak or give us guidance to tweak our policies. So uh, any, other, any questions related to that last slide? The one before. Thank you. Um, regarding the baseline of those, the soil and waterway, ocean health, and chemical pollution, will we, at what point will we have a baseline? And the reason I ask is that if our, our target is to reduce the number of samples that fail to meet guidelines, what is our goal in terms of do we want one less? Do we want, you know, do we want to reduce it by 100 samples that come back negative or however we language that? Like, so, so this, um, it makes perfect sense to me, but without numbers on it, um, it's hard to determine kind of what we're reaching for. Right, in terms of a draft target. Mm -hmm. um, again, this is one of the ones where there's a lot of variables, and I guess our intent would be, this is one where we've got to get more of the data ready for you. Um, and so if Ms. Lawrence was here on hand with us, I would probably have a, a better answer for you more specifically on this one. So where we didn't have tangible targets either already endorsed by you or where it was clear from the data, but we know we can get it, um, what we've done is put a directional target. Okay. And so maybe when we get to stages, the end of phase two, we may have some suggestions for you around what that target should look like and you'll be balancing that with the different policies, policy options before you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Here we go. Um, I'm back to this baseline and sort of along the same lines is, is we have a baseline in terms of our biodiversity of 2,152 hectares. The question though is, how do we decide if that is enough? And that that's where I'm, the, all of my conversations and comes around that is if it is enough how, how do how do we make the the decision that this is enough like are we what are we basing it on like are we basing it on um, a park within you know 300 meters of every single house and as, a, as an example or do we want it uh, made out differently and is it per person so like if we have more people do we need more parks so I'm guessing that's the part of it is, is and I get, and I'm to further to that, I guess that would be those, those markers, those would be how we would go into the future of adjusting these parameters. That's what I'm, I'm thinking along this line. So we have a baseline, yes, but what council policy or decision decides if that is a good, is, is that in the middle? And if it's not, then what do we do? I guess that's kind of where I'm hitting for it. These are all theoretical stuff I'm thinking because I, I don't know if that baseline is, because I don't have anything to compare it to. I guess that's the point. 
Yes, we have that many um, parks, um, but what are we comparing to? Is that a good number? How do we figure that out? Okay, through the chair to Councillor Bonner. Uh, so with this particular one, I want to point out that it's natural areas, so it's not our more program parks and facilities, number one. Um, number two is while there's a desire to generally increase, this is one of those indicators and also targets where I would see council having to balance. You have a finite boundary, you have a finite area of land where you could acquire a future park, and then you also fit in this part of the region. So when you're looking more broadly and you're saying, okay, we could turn the following areas into national area that currently aren't, what are the implications for your ability to absorb growth and other elements that you're trying to balance from a social, environmental, and economic perspective? So with this one, there are other things, and one of the things I perhaps didn't point out is, and we discussed with you on the March 10th workshop, is that there were other indicators or statistics out there that support some of these primary ones. And it might be that um, the, the indicators aren't very well developed yet, but we know that they help tell a bigger picture, which is, I think, perhaps where you're going with this, is how do we shape our decisions. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, you can measure how much natural area or program park area, which is a separate one per capita, and look at benchmarks through other municipalities. And does that tell you um, whether that's a good measure? But with this one specifically, where you're looking at lands and water are healthy and cared for and managed sustainably, um, you're looking at not only the um, area of lands, but how they're being maintained and managed. So I, I kind of wish we had um, uh, part, our Parks Rec and Culture folk here, but this is one where um, I do see that it's one where you might be good holding at that level because the city of Nanaimo has a really high proportion of natural area and programmed area per capita. And so as you, you may say, okay, actually what we want to do is actually increase our programming or our access. So we want to ensure the connectivity between different places. There might be other elements that you use to balance out what, whether you set a specific target to, mean, to increase and then what the implications are. And so you would factor this into perhaps your parks acquisition policy and different pieces like that. And so I think and I hope that as we come back to you with drafts of what the parks recreation and culture policies are related to that, that you start seeing, ah, okay, here's where we have the influence. And here's the trade-off. If we acquire this and make it natural area, we've got a finite amount of land. How do we balance that with you know, housing and other needs? I hope that helps answer your question. I hope too. the uh, work that's gone into this and I and I think like we are at a uh, at a more leading edge of trying to figure out you know this this concept of what is ecologically safe and healthy way of setting up human settlement and what are sort of the baselines and the the targets that is you know when you're building a city that you should be in around these things and um, you know I don't think that there's a lot of standards out there I mean there's different pieces all over the place and we are starting to formulate that. And I know that there's an incredible amount of interest in it and it's very uh, important work that needs to be done. Um, one of my questions, say for example, with uh, greenhouse gas emissions, is that, like you said, that this is sort of a, a con conglomerate uh, measure at, at the broadest scale to report back to the community and commu uh, communicate. Um, in the supporting plans, like the, cl the, the, the council, a sustainability or climate action plan, would we see sort of uh, secondary indicators or targets, for example, with to do with building or um, uh, GHGs or, or secondary ones that are sort of like uh, can allow for a greater operationalization of policy in that? So I think this is perhaps a good chance to talk about departmental key performance indicators and how they fit with these overall indicators. So. With the implementation plans that are more action-oriented, actually uh, you know, putting specific measures in place on a yearly or you know, over a five-year span, um, one of the things that different departments already do 
is in addition to these summary 21 indicators we have before you, uh, they measure things like, uh, you know, how much, how many people are attending different programs, how many um, households are uh, using different forms of waste management in, in just more finite detail. And I would see that continuing. Um, I'm wondering if you're asking if they would add to those, but some of those key performance indicators that are too um, specific perhaps to look at our overall progress as a community would help show whether we're moving in the right direction from a program point of view. So for example, while you might want more equitable, uh, I, I guess my, my mind's leaning towards parks, recreation, and culture, you might want to know um, how many people overall are using our programs. If you want to really look at it from an equity point of view, you would be measuring something more specific like gender, age, demographics, di other diversity statistics that could be monitored potentially at a level um, of more detail uh, through the online registration, for example, but we wouldn't, and it would so support those higher ones, but it would also help at a program level on an annual basis if you see that you're having fewer children under the age of grade five attend swim lessons and then one year you get nothing, then you might go, oh, maybe we should talk to the school district and ensure that we are getting uh, this particular target population up to increase water safety. And some of those types of pieces that are quite detailed but play into the overall goals uh, but then provide the direction to individual staff on what how their programs fit. Um, I, think, I think I've given you quite a lengthy answer, mm -hmm. so feel free to ask me to clarify if I didn't answer that properly. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I was going to say, Councillor Bonner's being wonderfully provocative today. It's, it's a good question, and, and there's another flip side to this. If, in fact, we see, and, and uh, Ms. Bopal Singh pointed out, it's natural areas, is the presence of so many hectares of park per capita within the city boundaries, if that is diminishing, you could say that's a bad thing. But if you don't contrast it with perhaps the statistics in the regional district, maybe it's a good thing. It means we're getting more people living in the city, less dependent on long sewer lines and heavy water consumption, et cetera. The whole thing, I mean, I, I don't, you have, to, you have to look at what the trends are. And, and part of what we're doing here, and I think this is really important, and, and Mr. Rudolph's pointed this out earlier today, what's the RDN doing? What does the strategic plan look like there? What is the community plan? Uh, overall look like? Uh, do we end up with just a bunch of urban sprawl uh, because people don't want to live in the city where it's easier on the environment and where transit makes more sense and it is, is more equitable? The, these are some wonderful big questions and, and I'm hoping um, that um, actually some people are listening to this discussion today because the kind of provocative questions that are being asked are what they need to think about if they're going to have input into what we actually decide here and what are those measures and how absolute and, and how good can they be? Because they reflect many things. Uh, I think, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a very, it may be a positive thing given the uh, interesting geography of this city and, and the lack of, of uh, natural space that's left that could be turned into parkland. Uh, maybe we're looking at the intensity of the use of our parks. We know that in the last uh, year and a half, there's been incredible pressure placed in our park system. Everybody's been out loving Westwood and Neck Point to death. I think that's a good thing. That's mentally healthy for people to be outside. But on the other hand, um, I'd also be interested in knowing something we don't have control over. What's the level of medication for depression that's being uh, sold, delivered in our city, and we don't have control over those statistics. But I think the whole thing, the best we can hope for, I think, is sort of a general direction. Um, I, I don't have high, high ambitions for exactly what we can do, but I think if we get the sense we're trending in the right direction, hopefully that we are. Uh, but, you know, we're going to run up against, and I throw this out provocatively, um, DL52, which will no doubt be the subject of potential land claims. 
I think many of us would like to see that land preserved in its natural state, but uh, I think many would argue in a healthy community that would form part of Sinamic First Nation who were dispossessed of these lands uh, over time and dispossessed of lands that were given to them under treaty terms. So um, this is the kind of discussion that I just love to see around this council table. So, uh, but I, I do have a question for the technology side of this, like uh, Councillor Thorpe. Uh, my little blue square is on, says request to speak. If I hit that, shouldn't it show up on? Oh, good, good. But but um, if I go off, I'm wondering if I hit it again, will I show up on your list? Then I don't have to keep raising. There's now a speaker. All right, so knock me off. I Th have no one. Thank you. Do I show up now? Yes. Good, it's working. Thank you. items of discussion and, and potential motions potentially for some adjustments and I, I think maybe I'll, I'll bring them at the end of um, of uh, once we see the other uh, thing on on the social foundations um, I, I do have one question though just regarding um so one one item that was brought up was was um, percent uh, permeable surface and I had, had spoken to um, uh, Mr. Lindsay regarding this and, and the intent um, was that is that basically uh, this whole concept of um, water balancing um, is, is being demonstrated as being important sort of on on multiple uh, measures in the sense of being able to control a stormwater runoff um, and the amount of use of, of, of engineered infrastructure and costs associated with that um, and then also ability to uh, treat water as it, um, you know, naturally infiltrates in the ground. And um, I know that there can be some issues, you know, if using a, a metric of just a blanket um, percent permeable surface in the sense that there's a lot of uh, rock uh, in town that can distort things. But the intent would be, uh, and, I, and I know that we've got a lot of policy put in place uh, in our, our, our engineering standards and then also sort of this discussion of natural assets. Is there anything that we could track that could monitor um, and our ability to emphasize and utilize sort of natural groundwater flows and to maintain natural groundwater flows um, as we develop our, 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 our city? Um, without counteracting and I'm just curious if there is uh, options for that not wanting to move anything today or, or press it but I'm just curious uh, for future discussion um, Ma Madam Chair if it, the question is specific to groundwater quality if I understand what you're saying um, or just water more here. more uh, water flow through the landscape so um, right I think sort of the, the general terminology is like water balancing, um, but it's just looking at uh, there's a lot of negatives if you have a lot of just uh, uh, um, uh, uh, non-permeable surfaces and it immediately goes into engineering right. pipes and out into the ocean, it, it can really uh, dry out the land, um, the water doesn't get properly uh, uh, filtered, um, and it can increase erosion, for example, example where uh, storm water does come out into uh, stream beds and that because of just high level flows and with increased rainwater uh, volumes potentially that is more and more of an issue and so that there's uh, a move and a, and a need to to be able to maximize uh, regular groundwater infiltration to slow that movement of the water through the landscape one to maintain ecological functioning in terms of mm -hmm. providing uh, you know fluids to everything but also to to mitigate negative impacts of, of flooding and that Madam Chair, I think, based on, thank you for the clarification. I think what I, what I would say on that point, then, and I think the city has been an early adopter, and for many years, Mr. Sims can speak to this about um, our, our storm rainwater management, and we actually have it in our um, engineering standards now. So it's new developments. We spend a lot of time looking at maintaining pre development flows, and that can vary from site to site. So if a site is contrib contributes to a watercourse or a, a creek, we want to make sure that the flows going into that 
uh, creek are maintained. And as I think you're mentioning, we don't want to see spikes, which often happen if you have a completely paved surface. You'd have a big storm event, runoff, you'd see a large spike and, and run off into that creek and a level of that creek go up and down, which is what we don't want. So, But I would say we, we have a more nuanced approach than just saying no permeable surface because in mm -hmm. some places uh, we'll have um, a combination of um, uh, rooftop rain gardens, we'll have... Um, if you think of Green Rock, for example, over off of Bowen Road, there's a number of open, um, what some people might see as ditches, but open um, systems to allow for water uh, to collect and where it's appropriate to go back into the ground. Uh, we have underground storage tanks that are used on individual properties and on large developments. Um, and we even have in some locations um, um, parking lots that are used to intentionally flood in those large events and then slowly dissipate over time so that those those natural systems, as you're saying, aren't um, impacted. So you're going back to, you know, how would you measure that? It ultimately gets back in our mind to, to measuring stream health um, is the key more than a general statement about just permeability, but which in my mind anyways, just touches on one, mm -hmm. one tool that's available. Right. Just to follow up on that, uh, I, I think that would be the determinant would be sort of like consistency of, of stream flows, because that would be the sort of proxy of looking at, you know, are, are all the measures that we put in place? And it's like we do have a lot of policy and put in place to achieve that. Are we effective in achieving that? And we'd see that if our stream flows were consistent mm -hmm. and not big spikes in that. Yes. Yeah. And uh, through the chair to Councillor Gaslebart. This was an indicator that staff looked at in terms of the availability, and we flagged it as a future indicator because we didn't readily have that information available. So to your point, and Ms. Lindsay's point around stream flow and groundwater recharge related to that, this is something we can explore further with the Ministry of Natural, uh, the Forest Lands Natural Resources who have groundwater hydrologists and who also monitor stream flow and stream licensing around do they have and are they collecting data that is helpful to us? Now, the one thing we have to also realize is our recharge area of streams extends well beyond our boundaries into the regional district, and, and that has a big impact on several of the streams in our, in our city. Um, so this is one that we had flagged as a future potential indicator, and we, with Council's blessing, intend to keep it as one. And at such time that we have that data reliably with support from, um, I would think it would be the Ministry of um, Forest Lands and Natural Resources, we can either use a proxy as um, stream recharge flow related to that, but also know that working with the regional district as part of their drinking water, groundwater protection program, that there may be some ways of working with them as they monitor more regionally um, the impacts uh, both beyond the watershed and what we have control over. So it is it is a tricky one, and one of the things as we look at, uh, we'll start with these preliminary indicators, hopefully a preliminary set that you endorse, but going forward with a monitoring program is coming back to you and saying, okay, if you want to monitor the following, here's what we think the costs are um, versus the reliability and you know what do you want to do related to that. So this could be one where we look at and explore it that way with support from the province and also the RDN. So um, does that? Great. No, no, that, that, okay. that's wonderful. And, and I do Thanks. think that there is a lot of opportunity for collaboration and alignment with what the regional district is probably mm -hmm. putting in place and, and working. So, yeah. Uh, and, and also with the province, given that they monitor and manage water licensing that has an impact on recharge as well. Um, then I also wanted to respectfully say, and Mr. Lindsay pointed out to me, I didn't do a very good job of answering your question earlier about the role of the action plans in having more distinct indicators below these. And so I wanted to specifically speak to, I think the example you had used, for example, like the, the climate action implementation plan and how that might differ from the policies that we have in an overall city plan. And uh, so, for example, with GHGs, we could break down and, through the action plan, monitor specific GHGs related to different modes of transportation, housing, and other aspects that then the, those action plans um, respond to and report back to council that way. So I'm wondering if the, I think that's, no, that's actually yeah. what you're asking, and I yeah. gave you a very long-winded explanation. So. That was good. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just further to what both Ms. Bopal Singh and uh, Mr. Lindsay are saying, it, engineering and handling of stormwater has shifted a great deal in the last 30 years. It, it's, you know, the, the big pipe solution is, you know, kind of the 70s, 80s approach, and, and uh, there's been a lot of maturity around that, and, and it's moving more towards natural assets as a global picture. Um, so we're, we're very sensitive to balancing the needs of not only public safety, because flooding is, is an issue, as we've seen in a few instances, um, but also stream health and, and ensuring, you know, regeneration of natural areas as much as possible. One of the, it, but just to maybe assure Council that this isn't just being put to the side and, and thought about later, this is, you know, actively investigated under our stormwater utility as an example. So that would be similar to our water utility or sewer utility, have a dedicated utility that may look at properties and their economic or their impervious areas as a means of raising a fee for that for their impact to the overall stormwater system so that's being that's also the subject of discussion here too okay says you are a speaker am I still on your list no no that's fine you can take me off is what I'm getting at <laughs> through the chair wow I sound quite loud there um, if you could turn to the second page in your handout and you'll see that we have the inner circle of the donut with the social foundations and goals related to that. And so if I can turn your attention to the top left corner of your handouts, and here we have um, the goal of a healthy Nanaimo related to community well-being and livability. So everyone has an opportunity for a healthy, safe and affordable home. And here we have some indicators that we've got before you as measures of progress towards this overall goal. So one is chronic and epi related to chronic and episodic homelessness, looking at the point in time count that's done um, every few years to uh, look at the number of people at one point in time in Nanaimo. This is the best information we have right now. We hope that going forward that there may be other ways of measuring this through a range of other um, Pieces, but this is the most reliable and one that's used across Canada by different municipalities. And as you know, we have documented and measured and presented to Council on that. The next one is rental housing affordability with the average rent of a two-bedroom apartment. Um, and again, we have a baseline for that from 2020. Vacancy rate that's provided by the Canadian uh, Canada Mortgage and Housing Association and um, with the percentage of vacancies in rental accommodation. And you can see our draft target is related to um, that 3% threshold that we have for the conversion of rental market stock into uh, strata. And as you know, this vacancy rate has been a very low, 1% uh, average 2020. And then and the last one you've got is a really important one in terms of looking at our how we meet housing demand going forward for a changing, evolving, and growing population, and that is the proportion of single-family, ground-oriented, apartment, and apartment housing types, and looking at that diversity and mix. And so, in terms of affordability, and also as people age in place, providing for more options for apartment and ground-oriented versus single-family, which is one of our dominant forms of housing, um, that mix is important. And you'll see we haven't got a draft target here. However, this is something that through the work and the feedback we get from the community on the different scenarios that we could look with Council at proposing what that might look like. So I'm just wondering if you have any questions on these ones before I move on. Uh, Specifically with this one, um, if I've got a, something that I'd like to put forward, could, could I do it now or should, do you want me to wait till we go I through? Would suggest now. I'll okay, great. Um, so, uh, Councillor Brown and myself had the opportunity um, of uh, participating in um, 
there's a conference uh, for well-being indexes, and there's a lot of interest in these, you know, the donut model fits under this idea of a well-being index for municipalities. And so we, we presented the, the donut um, and got feedback from a, a group of um, uh, folks in academia, and then also there are some municipalities present. And uh, one overall uh, feedback point was um, the, the lack, uh, missing anything regarding food um, within our, our donut model. Um, and um, what I think that a, a good solution, and I know working on a particular metric, uh, an indicator and target for it can be tricky. However, uh, there are some good examples sort of uh, in Vancouver around uh, local food assets um, in there. But um, uh, I think uh, adding uh, to this section, a healthy Nanaimo, community well-being and livability, um, to the goal, adding food along with, uh, with ha home, in there would um, put language in place to have uh, food security included um, and then at the same time uh, then we can develop a metric you know down the road uh, to, to be able to, to mon monitor that so I would propose to move that um, uh, under healthy Nanaimo community well-being and livability uh, the goal statement is changed to include food so that it reads so everyone has opportunity to have healthy safe and affordable food and housing and that this and that an indicator for increasing the consumption of local food is added in as an indicator Uh, thank you. Um, I think that's a really good point. I did want to share that I did go to the food sustainability at the FCM and there was some excellent stuff that I learned there. And one thing that did come out of that was that um, we do need to start at the municipal level and start engaging the broad public in food production because many don't understand it. So I think that's a really good point. And, and the thing that I took away from, from there was that uh, education engagement is critical and agriculture and agri-food systems can be used as we come out of the pandemic. So I think that's, I, I'm very much in favor of that. And thanks to Council, or Councilor Gesselbeck for bringing that forward. Thank you, Chair. Um, laudable goal, but I'd sure want to know what it means access to healthy food May I respond? well when i'm finished if you don't mind chair <laughs> i i think those are the kinds of statements that really require definition um as, as to what constitutes healthy food if you're a vegetarian um, if you're not getting any meat you would regard that as an extremely healthy diet if you're a consumer of, of uh, meat, it, it's a different thing. So I'm just, and, and my concern is what role does and can the city play? And I come back to those things which with, are within our control or that we can have significant influence over. Um, and apart from ensuring, you know, do we give tax breaks to people who have gardens in their backyard? And if so, how do you monitor it? And, and all of those things. Uh, I, I just, I think it, it may well meet the approval of council and it, it may suit the, the tenor of the times in terms of discussion, but in terms of what it means, I'm, I, I want to know that we can actually have use, useful contribution and at the same time be monitored in a way that, that's, that's positive. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the commentary. I, 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 I want to. I want to. I want to have this explained to me so that the public understands and gets it, and will be supportive of it. Otherwise, it just looks like a really nice idea that we're throwing out there because it's. It, well, everybody should have access to healthy food, but if they get, they, if they can't afford access to healthy food, how do we control that? If they have, is 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 it the is it the access to healthy food in the sense that it's available for purchase in the community? Or is it the ability to purchase, or is it some combination thereof, or something else that I can't think of this afternoon? Thank you. Before I go, you want to delete me? 
can't hear Zenny. Can you now? <laughs> okay. Before I go to Councillor Thorpe and Councillor Gesselbra, just before, just so I can respond, because food security is what I was looking at. And I saw it in previous donut economy. It, we did mention food security. And, and so I don't know if it's healthy food or food security, but I've worked on this for decades in this city in different programs. And I say, yes, our council has taken steps. We purchased five acre farms to help with food security in our city. We, we help loaves and fishes. We look at community kitchens and other programs that run in our city. And food security is paramount to being healthy. And unfortunately, and I've known this myself in the past as a single mom with two kids, eating healthy food is really a struggle. It's expensive. And so any ways we can promote farming or, or um, the farmer's markets or anything else, I think there are measurable tools out there. And I think there are things within our means that we can help make sure that the citizens in our city have healthy food security. So I'll go to Councillor Thorpe and then Councillor Gessebra. Um, your chair, and I believe Councillors Armstrong and possibly Brown had his hand raised too, but Councillor Armstrong, no, not Councillor Brown, just Councillor Armstrong. Thank you. Councillor Thorpe. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'll speak whether I'm being heard or not, <laughs> which is often the case. Uh, um, to to the, uh, the motion of Councillor Gesselbrock, I will support this. I think it's an important aspect that uh, we should include. Um, so I have no problem with that. But to, uh, to Mayor Krogh's comments, um, I agree with those as well. And yes, what Councillor Gesselbrock is suggesting seems uh, should we say idealistic, but when I look at uh, all of the, the goals or uh, outcomes on this side of the, uh, the handout that we've been given, I could say the same about all of these. And quite frankly, uh, this is simply an idealistic vision of, of uh, a wonderful sounding community, uh, a paradise where everybody has uh, an affordable house and everybody has a good job and everybody is thriving. Uh, isn't that nice? Uh, wonderful. It's reminiscent of, is it Samuel Butler? Erewhon uh, was the name of his imaginary place. And if you spell that backwards, you'll, you'll see what he was referring to or just about. Um, so I'll support Councillor Gesselbrock's addition to this, but I struggle with just how practical uh, these goals are and I recognize that it's laudable to take what small steps we're able to towards this vision, but I just find this way too idealistic to, to almost comprehend at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Gessler. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I think we're setting a, a vision. This, the, the, this donut model is definitely uh, something that is, is supposed to communicate the vision that we have for the community, and um, we definitely don't want to shoot low. So um, I think by changing the goal to so everyone has opportunity to have healthy, safe, and affordable food and housing, um, you know, to Mayor Krogh's comment, you know, what do we mean um, by access to food? And what we mean is having healthy, safe, and affordable food. And we, we do have a lot of policies put in place. Um, you know, we, we purchased the five acre farms. Uh, you know, we support the, 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 um, the loaves and fishes. Uh, we, we've also have in the works uh, the, the putting together of a, an Nanaimo Food Policy Council. And this council is representative of all the different, um, you know, uh, elements in our, our local food system with the purpose of providing policy ideas and, 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 and programs that the city can support to increase um, people's access to, to, to healthy, safe, and affordable food. And healthy, safe, and affordable food, when it comes down to it, um, you know, when you start factoring in uh, greenhouse gases and the, the trends does mean more local, safe, organic production. And that's what we're, we're shooting for. And in terms of being able to implement and measure, um, 
this is something that a lot of communities across Canada are working on and, it, and it's, a, it's an area where there's a lot of generation of like how do you track this and how do you support this and there's a lot of opportunities and ideas out there. Um, speaking with the members from Guelph, um, they're doing a lot of great work on this. Vancouver implemented a, a target on this uh, you know, many years ago, 10 years ago and, and their target which I put as a suggestion for staff is looking at um, number of local food assets and so a, a local food asset is farmers markets, community kitchens, urban farms, urban garden plots, um, uh, secondary processing facilities, uh, food security organizations. These are all things that we can track and yeah, this is not going to be a, a perfect empirical method of tracking our progress but we just want something to look at that we can track and speak to and also be a symbol of, of, of what we're about and so I think this is a, a, a start of an attempt of doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Armstrong. Thank you. I'm just going to read a couple of points again. Like I said, I found the, uh, the food sustain. I went, like I said, I went to the food security at the FCM and I found it fascinating. And one of the points that they did make, and I think, and I've talked to Councillor Martin about it, is one of the things that we need to look at is to show that we've lost a significant degree of our food skills. Like many people don't know how to use food to do canning, drying, et cetera. So in speaking with Council Martin, we do have a lot of this being done at the community kitchens, but maybe there's more that we can do on that by perhaps at uh, Parks and Recs offering a course and how do you can food or dry food. Those are ways where you can keep, you know, food in, in, in the minds of people and how you can use them longer instead of throwing them away because we, we do waste a lot of food. You know, we will buy strawberries, forget to use them and they mold. So there's things that can be done along there. So they talked about that. Uh, the other tools that they, they said to start to look at is strengthen our food system and, and it could be partnerships with VIU. Everybody assumes that agriculture has, uh, you know, mostly manual labor. That's not the case anymore. It's extremely technical. So you can work in partnerships with VIU to get the message out that for every graduate from uh, uh, agriculture, there's three to four jobs. So they were, they were saying that those are things that you can look at to get it out. And the other things that are being done, and it's already being done in this community, maybe more, is there is incentives for grocery stores and, and others to give their foods to loaves and fishes and the food kitchens and all that. So there's a lot of things that we are doing, but those are just a couple of measures that they, um, they put out. And they also talked about the uh, partnerships that, that have been made by the food banks locally. And what they, they said at that one was that a prime example is when the pandemic hit, all of a sudden they had millions of pounds of chicken wings coming into the food banks that they didn't know how to use. So they started to learn how to transform it and how to how to repackage and stuff. So those are types of things that we can look at in our community. I just wanted to throw that out, but perhaps we could actually at one later time do a thing on at the GPC where we actually bring in experts in this area to show how the municipality can get on board. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Armstrong. And I don't, oh, Len, uh, Mayor Krog. Yes. Uh, if I may, um, I'm grateful to Council Gesselbrock for, for giving us something to measure this by. So if it's the number of markets and, and things of that nature, it does give us something to, to measure. Uh, because candidly, I, I think otherwise it, it becomes, with, with respect, again, a, a statement of high ideals, as Councillor Thorpe suggested, but without much substance. Um, at the end of this, um, we're expecting a community to come forward with its comments, and I think we need to know quite specifically uh, what it is they're going to be expecting, and they can understand what we're suggesting might be appropriate. Uh, but before I leave this area, um, mix of housing types to be determined. My understanding is the City of Victoria, approximately 50% or more of the citizens in the City of Victoria proper are renters. And I think it's Vienna, there's many, what used to be referred to in England as council flats and something in the range of 70% of citizens in Vienna live in rental accommodation. Um, the last time I checked, one of the reasons people come to Canada is not just because we're one of the uh, solid, free, liberal democracies left in the world, it is because they have an opportunity to own land, property, you can call it a condo if you want, or a single family dwelling. That is one of the great lures of this country. And uh, this is not a criticism of staff because they're looking for direction from the community. But what do we put in there for a draft target? 
when it talks about mix of housing types. Do we want 70% of our community to be able to rent? Do we want 40% of them to be able to own a single family dwelling? Do we want 5% to live in condos? Those are the bigger, tougher questions because that's really going to determine what kind of a city we expect and think is the city we want. And so I'm looking forward not just to council, uh, what council thinks about this over time, but what does the community think about it? I mean, if we generally agree that living in urban areas, in multifamily dwellings, which take up less space on the land, which consume presumably fewer resources in terms of heat and light and, and uh, vehicles and all of those things, gas consumption, you name it. Is that the ideal that's bringing people to Nanaimo? Is that the city they want? These are the really tough questions. And again, I come back to it third time today, forgive me for being repetitive. Why this is really interesting philosophically about what are you looking for in your community and what are your expectations? And I would just politely suggest there's a heck of a lot of people moving to Nanaimo now and have been and will continue to do so because they don't want to live in crowded urban areas. They want to live in smaller communities. Uh, when we talked about access to parks, if, uh, if, we, if we had a, a proper well-designed city that had an urban ring, or, uh, a green ring around it, like Ottawa, uh, which may be hard to achieve without the cooperation of the regional district, then in fact people would have access to what we'll call parkland, even though the percentage of land inside our city limits devoted to park is quite small. That may be a positive thing, and again, I come back to it, that's where we may have to work really, really hard with the regional district. I remember the argument of many members of, um, uh, not a long forgotten, but uh, not the previous council, but the previous council before that, who argued that the city should expand to take over the, uh, the lands near Harmac, because if they didn't take control over them, then it would be the regional district allowing urban sprawl to spread out further. So again, all interesting questions, but I do come back to this. I'll be very interested to see what people have to say about what kind of a community they're looking at in terms of goals when it comes to mix of housing types. Thank you. And if you can delete me, Chair, then I'll feel better because I won't show up as you are speaker constantly. Thank you. And just, just before I call the question, because there is a motion on the floor, um, one of the other, um, I believe, ways to measure food security, who are we pointing at? Okay, I'll get to Councillor Bonner. Um, one of the measures is uh, when nobody needs the loaves and fishes anymore. Then we will have success. Councillor Bonner. Chair, may I know? There we go. Um, uh, Councillor Thorpe um, tweaked me to, um, to come forward. I'm not necessarily adding a lot to discussion here other than um, uh, I'm quite in favor of the motion as it is fine. I know we'll figure it out, uh, you know, the food issues. Uh, when you said you were looking to this made up imaginary um, idea of everyone getting along together and all the stuff, as you mentioned in this book, um, but you don't have to do that because indigenous populations in North America were living like that for centuries. And as I went through with more of this list, it appeared to me that every single one of these problems we're dealing with are colonial problems imported into North America. So at one point, everybody was being fed, everybody was being housed. And perhaps we should look at some of those ideas to see how they worked out as we go forward. Go. Thank you. Um, I'm happy, really happy to support this. And um, in terms of the five acre, uh, uh, the five acre farm. So food share really is the the folks who do canning and preservation to Councillor Armstrong's point. And it's interesting. Um, I went online and I looked at our, our rec, parks and rec programming and we have a section for food and nutrition, but we don't have any programming. Um, so that, I, I found that interesting because I would have assumed that's something we would have done. Um, I agree with the indicator of, of kind of uh, natural or part of me local food assets is a good uh, that's a good indicator and a good place to start um and i had another point and i've forgotten it 
that's yeah that's it thank you madam chair just i just want to make sure and i appreciate this discussion and thank you for councilor thank you for the committee for your input but i just want to make sure that we capture the motion and reflect it correctly so um, clearly understand the title and if i understand under elements if you look at this table there'll be a new uh, heading under elements which will be um, access to healthy food and then the remaining uh, draft indicator draft targets and baseline will show at this point as to be determined do we do we have that right because i've heard various indicators that could be used this afternoon but i just want to make sure that we're capturing the motion correctly uh, i sent the motion to uh, sheila um, and i will read it uh, one more time um, here so the motion is um, so i i was trying to think of within our current model of how we've organized everything how we could integrate food security into it and it, what made the most sense to me was to put it into this section and so what would change in how it's being communicated to the public would say so every where the goal statement is so everyone has opportunity to have healthy um, safe and affordable food and housing right now it says home and we'll change it to food and housing and then um, and then uh, an indicate and then and that an indicator for increasing the consumption of local food is added as an indicator. Um, that, I'm hoping another element will be added on and some indicator around local food security, improving local food security would be added. Um, and maybe um, it's not entirely clear from What the mo is that is that clear? The motion has stated that that would be the direction. Yes, through the chair to Council Gasovark, with um, so for example, with something like an indicator for improving local food security. Are you suggesting that the actual indicator is the number of community assets related to local food? No, I, I left it open. Okay, I, I understanding that we're. In the, we are going to go through a process of figuring okay. out what the indicators are. All I said was that in the motion, and that an indicator for increasing the consumption of local food is at, is, is is added as an in, oh. I, I have an older version here. The intent the intention is that at a later date we would develop an indicator and a target around food security, increasing consumption of local food, and that that would be added as an element through the chair. I'm just wondering if when you look at, uh, for example, the bottom right, inclusion and diversity, where we've got to be determined. So we've identified the need for a target and an indicator, but we just haven't quite landed on what. Yes. Could we do it that way? Yes. Okay, thank you. If, if council, yeah, is amenable, that was my intention. Um, sorry, Chair, Councillor Brown has a question. Uh, not a question, um, but uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Just a comment. Um, I'm generally supportive of this, com uh, this, you know, adding this in, but I, I am a little hesitant. Um, I think there is, um, I think there's work to be done here. That's, what, that's for sure, and, and a role, a role for the city to play, hopefully, in the future. But uh, I think what the indicators are going to be key for me. While I think access to uh, food assets is important, I actually don't think it touches, you know, I don't think it's actually a really great indicator in terms of are you actually ach achieving success? And and for me, even food security is also, there's a huge element around nutrition security and that, you know, that, that starts to touch into a bunch of other things. So well, I'm generally supportive of this direction. Um, I'm just not, certain on how so and i will support it uh at this stage anyways i, I will be interested in um if it, if it goes ahead the feedback that comes through both uh, you know staff uh, de deconstructing this a bit and looking at um potential indicators and targets and, and what those all mean and also any public feedback because uh well i do think it, it is important i think uh, the refinement of what we're aiming for here is is crucial so thanks
I'm not feeling ignored today, honestly, Chair. <laughs> Um, and I will resist the temptation to comment to Councillor Bonner that uh, the view of uh, Indigenous uh, peoples living in, in harmony with nature is one of the great, grotest, grossest, oldest, racist assumptions perpetrated by a guy called Russo and others, the, the so-called noble savage. Uh, in, indigenous societies had their troubles, as did all of us, and their civilizations collapsed like the Mayans, for instance, we don't know why they disappeared, the good folks of Easter Island. These were indigenous peoples, but that's a subject for another day because I believe we are all, as, as uh, Donna Stennis' father used to comment around the issue of race, if you close your eyes, can you tell where they're from when you listen to someone? So having teased you about that, I will comment on what uh, Councillor Brown had to say earlier uh, and, uh, and what I had to say earlier around the types of mix of types, housing types. Again, it'll be interesting to see what the commentary is from the community itself, because if we can't come up with measures that I think make sense, uh, then that's a message. The, the second thing is, and as he's reminded us, uh, this is also just putting it out there. That's all we're doing today. We're discussing putting it out there and hearing from people. It is on that basis that I will support the motion of Councillor Gesselbrock. Um, Chair, I don't believe your mic was on for that, and we will need a count of those opposed, just so we can, if there's any opposed. There I go. Okay. Uh, seeing no further speakers, I will call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? Councillor Turley is opposing. Thank you. Motion carries. Yes, Councillor Thorpe. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just before we move on, um, uh, uh, first of all, I'm not going to make a motion, but it, 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 to me, there is something that's, that's I think, maybe missing that uh, I've heard about many times from people in our community. Uh, so I'm just going to mention this. Uh, and staff can do with it what they will. But when, when people talk to me about what attracts them to Nanaimo or brought them to Nanaimo, they usually mention relative affordability, um, houses and, and just uh, livability. And I think that's mentioned here. Well, I know it's mentioned here. They talk about the ability to find a, a decent job, which is mentioned here as one of our goals. Uh, they refer to access to uh, both nature and recreational facilities, which I, I see covered here, which is good. But the other thing that I don't see specifically covered is, um, and I hear this all the time, people want to live in a community which they uh, see as being a clean and a safe community. And to me, that would come under community well-being and livability, uh, but I don't see it specified. And I think it's, I suspect it's something that we will hear about because I hear about it constantly. So I'll leave it at that. The only other comment I would like to make is that all of these items and all of these lofty goals are going to be very uh, crassly driven by the city's financial limitations and our constraints. And uh, we can't, do everything for everybody or be everything to everybody. Uh, the items that I just mentioned, uh, safety and uh, cleanliness in our, in our city, for example, come down to uh, service levels, and that's a budget item. At least that's something that I think we have direct control over as opposed to some of these other goals. But uh, I just mentioned that for, uh, for feedback that I have already heard. Thank you. Councillor Armstrong also has her hand raised as well. Okay, Councillor Armstrong. Thank you. I want to echo um, Councillor Thorpe's comments. That's the majority of the emails that we are getting in is about safety in our community. And I don't see it any place in here. And I think that's a really important thing that needs to go in there. It, it's um, our police and, and fire budgets are two of our highest budgets, with all, which all go towards community safety. And it, I don't see it reflected anywhere in, in the reimagine, unless somebody could point it out to me. But I do think that needs to go in there. And it is measurable. 
So I think it's a really important important factor. And I mean, like I said, all we have to do is refer to the many emails we get daily on safety in our communities and people that are actually leaving the community because of not feeling safe. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hammonds. Thank you. I, I agree with the previous comments, although I acknowledge that safety is, um, that would be a very hard one to set indicators uh, for because I think it's, it's subjective, it's a feeling. Um, but I, I, I would support seeing um, an element of that in here. My comment uh, um, pertains to the chronic and episodic homelessness and the draft target of eliminating it by 2025. And I just am not sure that that's a goal that we can actually meet. And so I'm, I'm a, I believe that we should be setting goals that we can actually achieve. And if we look at the landscape as it resides right now, um, that is probably not something we can do. So I would look at expanding that timeline out. Um, in terms of the mix of housing types and the to be determined draft target, a question for staff. When we're looking at our scenarios, our land use scenarios, um, I'm making a linkage between determining which scenario we choose and which and, and kind of some indicators in here or some targets in here because if we choose densification around urban nodes then we're probably looking at multifamily units um, rather than single families so uh, my, I guess my question for you is am I reading that accurately that, that we will have um, this will be further fleshed out once we have that land use scenario identified. Through the chair to Councillor Hemmons, yes, that's correct. And what we're wanting to see is how people respond to the different scenarios about where they want to see growth. Uh, we do know that we've in the past received pushback from densification in certain neighbourhoods. So are people willing to accept growth more in other areas like our corridors and town centres? And that in turn influences the um, type of growth. Thank you. I think we can move on to the next topic. Through the chair, I just wanted to quickly acknowledge that um, the issue around measuring safety was raised by Council, and I believe on May 10th, when Ms. Constell presented to you, uh, there was some discussion about the challenges with how to measure safety. And of course, you can do things like use the Crime Severity Index, but it's not a full picture of how safe a community is. And in fact, there have been instances where people's perceptions of feeling safe seem quite contrary to the actual statistics. And so, again, other alternatives going down the road is we monitor progress um, towards our goals. And we can look at things like, does council want to spend the money doing um, citizen safety surveys? You know, is this something that other entities are doing and can support us with? Uh, but at this time, we don't have that readily available in what's felt to be an accurate and meaningful way. So just wanted to say that many of the things you're pointing out, like food security, we did wrestle with as staff how to do that. And so there are some things here that are indicators that are measurable. And we did debate. We can list the number of programs that Parks, Track and Culture might do with community gardens, for example, and the number we have. But does it tell us that those community gardens that we have are being used to their full potential um, and how do we round that out and again I think this goes back to the action plans and how those are implemented and monitored and council has endorsed an emergency food and nutrition strategy and through that implementation there may be while we have this higher arc key uh, or higher level of smaller goals um, <laughs> <laughs> clearly I'm speaking too softly um, that there are, as I think Council Gessebart pointed out, opportunities where staff can monitor and measure those more timely um, action plans that come to you uh, versus this bigger plan that we re review every 10 years in a fulsome way. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Armstrong. Thank you. I just wanted to go back to what uh, Councillor Hermans talked about when we were talking about the chronic, chronic homelessness. Again, that's another one I went to at the FCM. And um, they were very concerned about how we are all using three and five year plans, which they say don't work and shouldn't even be in, in the equation. And one of the things that they did talk about is what we need to change on how we're looking at it. And you need to start looking at it towards homelessness. You wanted it in equitable reductions in homelessness. And right now we are not looking at that. We're only looking at, um, from my perspective, working at the street population. We're not looking at the couch surfers. 
We're not looking at the reasons why. And they said um, relying on the census data is totally meaningless as it's old and you need the real time. So you need to break it all down into groups and find out who's been housed, why they've been housed and why they haven't. So just something to throw out. But um, this guy that was speaking, his name is Tim Richter and he's worked in, in 14 communities and he's leading the veterans charge in the United States and apparently is very successful. So just something you might want to look at is that they're changing totally the way we've been measuring homelessness uh, in the future. Thanks. Thank you. Through the chair to Councillor Armstrong and Council in general, um, you've all endorsed and adopted the Health and Housing Action Plan. And as part of the transition process of that, monitoring in more detail the factors that lead to and um, also address our response to homelessness. Again, we'll give that detail. And there's an example of an action plan that exists that will dovetail into this overall. And the progress towards that, a lot of that is quite data driven. Um, and in an ideal world, as we see where the transition group um, comes back to council, uh, will involve a systems planner organization that is responsible for monitoring that data in a much more refined way than the number that you see here. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to say that your mic is extremely crackling and fuzzy, so I don't know if there's an issue or not, or if it's maybe just coming through mine that way. I think it's coming through yours. We hear it fine. I'm experiencing it as well. Hmm. Um, Chair, through you to Councillors Armstrong and Councillor Brown, is it everyone's microphone or just Ms. Bull pulsing? Uh, it's, I believe it's just staff. There's some some sort of fuzziness or uh, possible interference on coming through. Can you? Yeah, hear I just heard a little bit when Zenny or when Councillor Martin spoke last too. So. And it wasn't that way at the beginning. I don't know if it was for Councillor Brown, but it just started in the last uh, about five minutes. Councillor Turley. Okay. Thank you. Um, Chair, through you to um, to all of the committee. It, perhaps maybe there, there's a recess scheduled for three o'clock. But if you wanted to have a little break now, perhaps they could then look at some technical issues and you could get back to this discussion. But I would just ask staff um, if they if they would rather carry on now, or I think it might be best to get these technical issues maybe sorted out. Is that a time for a clean break for in between topics, right? So. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I don't believe Ms. Bhopal Singh is done yet with this topic, but if Councillors Armstrong and Brown are having difficult hearing, perhaps we should have a break and see if we can fix that. Thank you. Let's, let's call recess. Oh, Councillor Brown. Oh, no, uh, Ms. Uh, thanks, Ms. Gary. I, I wasn't clear that we were done with this topic, uh, so I under, my understanding is we're not done with this topic. So a 10 minute recess. And just in case councillors Armstrong and Brown didn't hear, we're gonna have a 10 minute recess now and look at the technical problems. Thank you. Hi, Leonard Krogh here. I'm here with Karen Lindsay today. She's going to show me how to sign up for our app. Boy and Alert, the City of Nanaimo's emergency notification system. 
So we'll start by going into the App Store, Mayor Croak. Done. Next, you're going to hit uh, search. And you're going to search for the app, which is Voyant Alert. So it's V-O-Y-E-N-T. Now you see it it's already up. selected it. Click there, hit get, and then we're going to install. And why are we downloading this app? We're downloading that so that you can get this onto your phone system. And what it will do is it will send you a push notification out. So if the city of Nanaimo issues an emergency alert, it will actually push the notification out onto your phone. Um, the really uh, nice part of this app is that it's it's anonymous, so it goes by postal code. So you're, we're not requesting you to put your name or personal information in. It just works off of the app through your phone system. There are also, um, if you have family members or friends that maybe don't have a smartphone or would like uh, another way, you can also sign up online or call our public works department and they have uh, phone and texting options available as well. So there's lots of options for people depending on what their needs are. Fabulous. So you can rest with some comfort knowing you can find out what's necessary and know that people who are important to you are notified. Absolutely. So now you have Voyant Alert on your phone. And now just select Open. So the next thing you're going to do is you're going to tap in the postal code that it's prompting you. All right. So, so you just click on there and start entering. And then find on a map. So here you'll see the welcome page for yes. the city of Nanaimo and yes. you want to collect subscribe to notifications. Yes. Yes. Click that you agree to the terms. So click both to the yes for consent and then hit next. And it's yes. going to ask um, to either allow or not allow notifications and you want to always allow. Always allow. Always allow. And the reason that is if you don't allow it won't push the notification out to you. So always allow. Always allow. And now you see here, you've got a, a message to accept that you've signed out. That's the two-factor authentication and you're going to tap yes. And now you're in the system. Also, when you have a moment, we recommend that you pick your locations and sign up based on those locations. And then you'll get alerts from the city of Nanaimo. Karen, thank you. Everyone, sign up. Hey, Tiana. Hey. This sure is the coldest rink in town. <laughs> oh, yeah, buddy! Nice save, James! <laughs> wow, your goalie is keeping you guys in the game. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, oh, oh man, that's hot. Sorry, that's the way I like it. Oh. Go, 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 go! go. Shot. Scalds from hot drinks are a leading cause of hospitalization for children under five. Two minutes, down in the front, unsportsmanlike conduct. Hot tea and coffee will cause serious burns to a child in less than a second. Got a kid? Use the lid. What we have here is the real ice technology that was installed at the Nanaimo Ice Centre. It uh, allows us to use cold water from traditionally hot water that we used to use for making ice. Basically, the water will come in through the bottom, go in through a vortex idea, uh, making the air bubbles microscopic in size, which makes a better, more dense sheet of ice. Differences that you'll see with the real ice is there's less snow developed, so uh, that's easier for cleaning, and also it's a denser, harder, clear ice. So the ice skaters will certainly enjoy that. And the city plans to uh, implement real ice at our other two arenas as well. Some of the other efficiencies we've implemented in this facility are LED lights in some areas, and we've also, in the last few years, installed a higher efficiency refrigeration system, which lowers our energy costs. Both Sambonis at our facility are now electrically operated, 
so there's no harmful emissions and uh, they're very quiet as well. So what this means for the city is that we're able to use less energy and also reduce the amount of greenhouse gas emissions which is more beneficial to the environment. We're here uh, at Bruce and Dundas. Um, somebody's stolen the street names that were here, so we're here to replace them. Our sign shop has just generated us two signs, so I'm gonna go through the process of uh, putting it together and reinstalling the street names. First thing, we gotta center the signs. We do everything on this truck. We've got all the equipment on here to build, install, remove, repair, um, whether it's street signs, street names, uh, posts, banners. Um, Christmas decorations and so forth. I'm going to uh, basically just put the sign in the brackets and we'll be doing both signs of course so I've got a cross bracket that I'm going to put in and then add the top sign which is this street we're on Dundas. Sorry do the same there. We put the street that we're coming up to on the bottom so they all basically have the same. The cross street will be on the top. We've got to put some bolts in to secure them so nobody will steal the street name. We're ready to go. I'll just put this back and we'll go out and install this where the missing one is. Every year we do what we call a stop sign survey where we go around and check all the stops. We clean them, make sure they're in the right spots, in good condition, not bent. And we also clean the, the street names, make sure they're good. As we're doing that, if there's ones that we decide we want to replace, um, we do that at that time. This year, we're looking at approximately about 120 sets. It's very expensive to do, but we're continually, weekly changing street names because of either them getting damaged or uh, people breaking them and taking them. So I'll put this on. And then I put a bolt through to secure it to the post. There we go. And uh, that's good, we're done. Dundas and Bruce Ave are now uh, ready to go.
it's snowing. <laughs> what? And so we've called the meeting back to order, and I think we are going to start with Lisa. Well, how do I say your name? Bob. Bob Posey. Thank you. Councillor Hammond? Thank you. I've noticed the system has locked me out on the break. Um, I'm just I'm going to before we go on to the next section, thank you. Uh, I'd like to make a motion around our draft target in the elimination of homelessness by 2025. So I would like to uh, move that we remove the timeline on that mm -hmm. and that our draft target is the elimination of homelessness in Nanaimo. Okay. Second. And I think if I, if to speak to it very briefly, first of all, the target of 2025, um, as someone who worked very closely with the Health and Housing Task Force is, is likely very unrealistic. And putting another date on it, we could just be find ourselves in the same scenario of having to backtrack that date. So I think if we have a general uh, target of eliminating homelessness in the city, then we're, we're covered. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further speakers, I'll call the question. All those in favor? I, I would like to speak to it, Madam Mayor. Oh, sorry, yeah. I didn't see you, Councillor Brown. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, I will not be supporting this. I agree with Councillor Hemmons that 2025 is a little bit too near term. Uh, however, I think having no date is highly problematic because it, it uh, um, doesn't really set any ambition to solving uh, you know, or getting this close. I don't think you'll ever get there, but uh, I do think you need to have a a year that you can start to work backwards from and and, and measure your results. So uh, no, I will not be supporting just uh, elimination of homelessness. Thank you. And Madam Chair, I don't know if Councillor Armstrong is there, but I saw a hand up. So if she could respond or um, say she is there if she is. Okay. Okay, thank you. Seeing no further speakers, I'll call the question. All those in favor? And noting Councillor Brown is opposed? If you could call those opposed, that would be great. Ask for those opposed. Those um, opposed? And Councillor Brown, for some reason you're not on the screen, but you are opposed, correct? Uh, correct. Thank you. Motion passes. Yes. The next section. Okay. So if I could move to the next slide, I think the Zoom screen maybe has to be off for that. Thank you. Okay, so the next quadrant we're looking at on your handout is the bottom left, and that is uh, with the goal in an enabled Nanaimo uh, economic prosperity. So everyone has the opportunity to find good employment and business can thrive. And we have three elements there with related indicators. One, working age population, with a draft indicator percentage of population that are of an age likely to be in the workforce, a draft target of 67%, and the current baseline for 2020, uh, which is 63%. Um, then the next one is non-residential building permits with the value of commercial and public building permits issued. Uh, with a general increase with a target to be um, specified at a later date. And again, there's a baseline there. And then the third one is ample and diverse business opportunities with a number of total businesses and businesses with employees. Uh, again, with a general increase, directional target, with a specific one to be determined in the future. And again, we have baseline indicator for that. So these are all three indicators for which there is easily accessible and reliable data. Um, and I do understand that council likely has some discussion around these, so. A question too to staff. I'm curious about the baseline for the working age population at 63% for 2020. Given the uh, COVID scenario and all the government aid that went out, 
Uh, I would have to believe that probably has muddied the waters a bit because um, there were jobs going unfilled and then there were people who in specific, in other words, more specific industries were affected, others did really well. And I'm, I'm kind of curious why we would maybe use that one when one with the more playing, at level playing field might be more appropriate. Yeah, uh, <coughs> through the, sorry, through the chair to Councillor Turley, the, the numbers were taken before the pandemic. Um, and the 67% is the BC average. Okay. So the, the goal is to kind of stay around the BC average. Um, so the baseline might be somewhat irrelevant as long as we're trying to keep okay. up there. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Gessmer. Uh, chair um, just uh, following up on the discussion that we had uh, at the last uh, governance and priorities uh, meeting um, the last time that we discussed these indicators um, it was mentioned by a few people and myself uh, some some issues with uh, non-residential building permits uh, being a um, indicator um, and um, I think that, uh, yeah, this indicator and target associated it can be uh, misleading, and it is a um, it's a it's a growth indicator that isn't very specific to anything, and it it, it can misrepresent actually uh, healthy long term economic well being. Um, it's prone to boom and bust cycles and such, and so. Uh, Ms. Mann has uh, suggested another indicator, um, the economic structure index. Um, and uh, what the economic structure index, um, it measures the diversity of the Nanaimo economy by comparing the city's employment share by sector to that of the BC or Canada. Um, so the idea behind it is that, um, is that being a more diverse economy is, re is, a, is a resilient economy that can withstand boom or bust cycles um, of the global economy uh, far better. And the economic diversity index um, allows us to monitor growth in new and underperforming high potential sectors. Um, so I'd like to move that the indicator for economic prosperity, um, non-residential building permits be replaced with the economic uh, structure index. Do I have a second? Seconded by Councillor Hemmons. And Right now on the speakers list, I have Councillor Brown, Councillor Armstrong, and Councillor Bonner. So, Councillor Brown. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I'm happy to support that as I intended to move a motion to see that one removed. So, I think that's a um, a better a better measure. Um, uh, just because it, it is around resiliency and um, I. You know, we don't want to be over reliance on construction for our economic output. It, it's great if there is some economic output there, but I think uh, at the end of the day, we do want a more diversified uh, economy, um, especially one that's not as prone to boom and bust cycles. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Councillor Armstrong. Thank you. Um, I agree with what's said, but I also would still like to keep the non residential building permits in there because I do think that's also a factor we should look at. So I, I would like, I, I don't want to see it removed. I would like it to stay and then add on Councillor Gesselbrecht's motion as an additional factor. Just my two cents. Councillor Gesselbrecht, are you open to that? Uh, and, uh, my, uh, my preference is to have it uh, removed. I think there's, there's a few issues uh, that are problematic with it um, that I don't think that it's, it's kind of counter a bit to the, the premise of, um, of donut economics in the sense that if, if we're just looking for an increase each, each year in, in the amount um, of, uh, of, of building, uh, non-residential building permits, there's just, there's not really any limit. And I think that uh, things need to be associated to more uh, a balance of per capita ratio and, and something that can look at what, what exactly is the investment in? I think, uh, yeah, the, like for example, um, you know, in the years where we built a whole ton of uh, strip malls uh, in town here, that would show really high, uh, you know, uh, building permit um, uh, value. 
and uh, it, it had negative impacts, you know, long-term economically. Uh, so I think we're looking for a more balanced uh, measure. Yes, sir. Thank you. And, and Madam Chair, unless there's a formal amendment, the motion is as Council Gazabrock has put forward. Yes, and Mr. Corson. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, this is a great indicator, and it's a nice way to look at a diversified economy. Uh, just one of the challenges with getting the data is it's $10,000 to get the data um, for that one indicator. And hopefully after that, it will be um, no cost after that. But there is a, an upfront cost of securing that data, just so you're aware of it. I think that's why we've looked at some of these other ones which are... Um, don't necessarily disagree with you on the building permits, but it's one that we track for free. So this other one will have a cost to it to, uh, to secure. Okay, thank you. And I've got um, Councillor Turley, and then I see both Councillor Brown and Armstrong still with their hands up. So thank you. Councillor Turley. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm not convinced I can support the, the motion because uh, developers do not build commercial buildings to sit empty. Um, they basically will, um, if, if we want to have a green economy, um, the idea of having more commercial space is, of course, a, a thing you would strive for, and, and it would be good, in my opinion, a good indicator of where, uh, where we're going. Um, yes, if it's just strictly retail, then that Council Gorbachev is correct, but I, I, I think the indicator of, of of more green economy should rely on some of the building permits for, for commercial buildings. Thank you. And Councillor Bonner, are you not? And so I'm going to go to Councillor Brown. No, nope. Councillor Armstrong. No, nope. <laughs> okay. Mayor Crow. Uh, th th thank you, Chair. I couldn't, no request to speak would pop up. In any event, um, I think Councillor Armstrong has raised an important point, and, and in particular in this community, having been here for a while, um, residential construction has often indicated good times in Nanaimo, but that was it. It was residential construction. It didn't mean we were diversifying our economy. It didn't mean we were attracting new businesses. It didn't mean we were attracting tech, uh, tech companies. It didn't mean any of those things. And so, honestly, for this particular community, I, I think measuring that kind of um, other construction has some value um, and I'm prepared to make a, a move an amendment uh, that uh, combine what's uh, Ms. Geary what's probably the, the best motion for in terms of practical wording you know what I want I want them both on as indicators and let the public decide by comment um, thank you madam chair through you to mayor Krogh the amendment would be um, to amend Council Gesserbrock's motion to include the non-residential building permits. That was the initial indicator. Um, so to um, have his, his indicator um, with the addition of non-residential building permits. Thank you, then that's my motion if I have a seconder. Seconded by Councillor Thorpe. Would you like to speak to it any further? Uh, only to say I, I just, this is something that's going out to the public. And it just, I, I don't want to overwhelm them with choices like the junk food aisle in the grocery store. Uh, but at the same time, I don't think it's unreasonable given past uh, statistics kept by the city and what staff has had to say. I don't think it's unreasonable to keep them both in and let the public comment. Councillor Thorpe. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. The system really doesn't like me today. Um, I agree with Oh. Um, um, Madam Chair, is there a way you can turn his microphone on at all? Um, no, because he doesn't show up. Or maybe I can... I've already done that. Um, yes, Councillor Thorpe, if you could move to Councillor Brown's chair, that would be great. Oh, oh it's a whole new perspective from here. <laughs> <laughs> I've changed my views on a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to sit next to Councillor Bonner, though. <laughs> oh, dear. 
there. Uh, now, what was I going to say? No, just that I agree that uh, I'd prefer to see both uh, as Councillor or uh, Mayor Krog is suggesting in his amendment and uh, Councillor Armstrong suggested. And again, I come back to this. This is not our document. This is not what we think. We want to hear from the public. And I think uh, both of these indicators uh, are worthy of being there. And let's hear what people have to say. Thank you. Thank now you. I'm moving back. Okay, now I do see Councillor Brown's hand up. Councillor Brown. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I, I'm happy to support this amendment as well. I, I, I don't actually um, totally buy into the sentiment that we got to really limit our indicators. I, I think it's important to make sure that we have indicators that uh, help us um, help us see these different uh, focus areas from multiple perspectives uh, as as uh, Councillor uh, Thorpe just switched his perspective there a little bit uh, so I think multiple indicators uh, if they're all uh, you know if they're all just a slightly they can be slightly different and they're gonna and it's gonna be useful as well so I I'm happy to support it I, I don't particularly see a whole lot of value in non-residential building permits, but I do think it is uh, interesting to know whether it's going up or down and, and, and some of the ratios around that in comparison to other types of building permits. So, um, yeah, happy to support the, um, the amendment and keep it in because I think uh, some of these things, uh, the more information is actually the better in terms of understanding how well your your policy uh, mechanisms are, are working. So, if, you know, for example, if we are, um, you know, it would be kind of interesting to see in partnership with, say, the, the added one in, if you we are, we're seeing increasing uh, diversification in the type of businesses that we have in Nanaimo, but it's also driving um, non-residential building permits. Uh, that's neat. Or um, alternatively, it, it also, if it's not, and there's the reper, you know, non-residential building permits, I would understand, would also capture uh, repurposing of existing buildings and tenant approvals and things like that. So I think in conjunction with uh, multiple indicators, you can paint a kind of more picture. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Councillor Gessepa. Thank you. Um, I agree with the perspective that uh, it's interesting information. Um, I don't think that it is an indicator that's aligned with sort of the tenets of, uh, of a donut economy and, and reflects, um, you know, the, the donut does challenge this, this notion of um, measuring success by uh, growth and without um, defining what we're, we're trying to achieve and, and really, um, the non-residential building permits, what's the target? That we have a certain amount of uh, uh, investment every year or we're trying to grow it every year? It just, it, it doesn't, it gives you information about what the economy is doing, but not really what you're, you're trying to go for and achieve. And uh, so I just, I can see the value of having it like some other indicators, like for greenhouse gas emissions, you know, we don't have all the indicators that are in there they're within the climate action uh, sustainability plan around specific ones around buildings and such. For the economy, I think that the economic structure index is a, is a much more fulsome uh, in indicator that you can have targets that will reflect you know, a healthy, resilient uh, economy. Um, and the uh, non-residential building permits can be something that we report on within the economic uh, uh, strategy plan. Um, so. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank I, you. So I can't support this. Okay. I see no further speakers. I'm going to call the question on the amendment. Oh, oh, <laughs> Miss. <laughs> Try <Go> trying. <laughs> uh, Madam Chair, um, it's an interesting discussion. I was thinking of uh, this may be more leaning towards where the original motion came on the table, but. Uh, one of the, I think it was City of Surrey, one of the OCPs that I looked at years ago had a, a policy objective, a certain, it was balanced tax base. It was looking at it from a different perspective in that I think they were aspiring to have 65, 35% of their tax base derived from non-residential. And they were at uh, 
25 percent. So they, they were trying to go from 25 percent of their tax base to 35 percent just to have that balance. And so they used this type of an indicator to see if they were, so they could see every year where they were through the finance department if they were actually moving up to get a more of a balanced tax base. So maybe building permits would be an indicator, but it's, it's just, there, there are a lot of stats around this that give you a sense of it. So it, there's actually a monetary side to the city as well in terms of our tax base. And one of the things that we seem to have enjoyed, if I can use that term, during the COVID period is that the diversification of our economy here has served as well in terms of the COVID times because it's thankfully not all been just in the tourism sector or service sector. It's given us that balance. So there's there's more to it than the land use and that, that type of thing. And I just want to say maybe there's more work that needs to be done on this, but in that, that one plan that gave me a very good indicator where they are trying to go and why to, to create that balance, not only for jobs, but for revenues for the municipality so they could provide the services that the community were looking for. Just thought I'd mention it while I was thinking of it. Thank you. Seeing no further speakers, I will call a question on the amendment to the motion. All those in favor? Any opposed? Councilor Gessabra opposing. And so now I'm going to move to the main motion as amended. Seeing no further speakers, all those in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none opposed, motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Ms. Opusi. 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 Okay, so if we've finished our discussion on this. I, oh, I do have sorry, one guess about uh, added thing. Um, I think um, this donut framework, you know, is going to be presented to the community. And I think that it is a, it's an important, um, uh, an important communication tool. And I think language is important. And, and, and one um, frame shift is just around the word prosperity. Um, I think uh, prosperity is uh, it's something that we do want and like this idea of like flourishing and, and prosperous but also um, economic prosperity can be just you know making profit and, and, and a lot of times that's not really um, that's not 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 what been shared equitably and the whole purpose of, of the donut model is to say instead of measuring you know, the purpose of our economy is to meet these social objectives of, 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 of operating within our ecological limits and, and meeting the needs of, of our communities. And that's sort of like what we're measuring success is. And so economic prosperity, you know, when it's now within the donut, it's kind of like, well, what is it trying to say, like trying to, to, to for economic gains? And I think more appropriately, what we're trying to go for is economic resiliency that we can withstand boom and bust cycles that we can provide jobs for the community member in a, a diverse sectors uh, over the long term regarding and and prosperity uh, doesn't yeah resonate with what my what I, I think that we're, we're trying to go for and so I, I'd move to change the the title from economic prosperity to economic resiliency seconded by Councillor Hemmins I I think you've spoken to it, yep. <laughs> Councillor Gessabra. Does do I have any other speakers? I don't see any speakers. I'm just going to call the question. Oh, Mayor Cook. Uh, thank you, Chair. As much as prosperity may not be the perfect word, I'm not convinced that resilience gets us further down the path in terms of of what we want in a community. Um, resilience implies to me you survive through tough times. It doesn't mean you do the right thing in good times. And, uh, and therefore, it, it seems to narrow. I mean, I, I think, you know, all of us want to live in what I think most people would call a prosperous community. In other words, one in which there is largely full employment and people have access to goods and services and food and, and everything else. And uh, I honestly, if, if it's a choice between the words prosperity versus resilience, I'm going to stick with prosperity because I think it's more easily understood, whereas resilience by implication 
is it's about survival. I mean, you talk about resilient species, you talk about uh, resilience at, in the face of adversity. Uh, I just, and I'd, I'd be delighted if someone around this table can come up with a better word that uh, gets us to where the people of Nanaimo will look at this and say, yeah, I get this, that's what we're talking about. It's, it's, it is, if you will, the ideal of the, the donut economy or model and it's a word that everyone can understand. Seeing no further speak. Oh, Ms. Gurry? Um, Councillor Armstrong is, oh. has her hand up there. Councillor Armstrong. Oh, thank you. I, I agree with what uh, Mayor Croke says. Perhaps maybe a word would be economic stability. Mm. There's a motion on the floor. I'm going to call the question. No further speakers, call the question. All those in favor? We've got Councillor Hemmons and Councillor Gesselbrock and Councillor Bonner. Um, if Councilor you Brown. actually um, just call those opposed, we'll get those hands raised and then we can see if the motion passed or failed. Okay. All those opposed? We've got Mayor Krogh, Councillor Martman, Councillor Thorpe, Councillor Turley, and Councillor Armstrong. So the motion fails, yes. Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Gesselbaum. Who, all who, who is all opposed? Uh, the ones of, the ones that were, well, the ones that opposed were Councillor Gesselbaum, Councillor Hemmons, Councillor Bonner, and Councillor I, I, I think the motion passed. I think opposed no. was four and four it, thing, or no? Okay. Five, four. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Oh, Councillor Brown. Uh, thanks. I was actually trying to propose a, an, an amendment, but now I'm going to propose that it's a brand new motion. I would like to propose that uh, the heading be changed uh, to economic prosperity and resilience. Resiliency. Wait. Resiliency? Prosperity and resiliency. Prosperity and resiliency. Seconded by Councillor Hemmons. You want to speak yeah, to just it, speak, Brown? speak to it quickly. Um, I, I, I agree with uh, the comments of uh, His Worship that people do want a prosper, prosperous community, you know, they, and that means different things to different people. Um, however, I do think economic prosperity can disappear very quickly, and in those moments, you definitely want to make sure you're resilient uh, as much as possible to uh, the change in macro can decimate communities and some of that i think we've touched upon through you know things like diversity of employment etc cetera, etc cetera. so i see no reason why they both can't be there because i think we do want to be pros prosperous but we also do want to be resilient resilient i can't speak right now so um so i, I think they go hand in hand together of what, what people want in their lives thank you councillor armstrong you're muted councillor armstrong well, I'm just going to say I, I'm in favor of that. I think it makes a lot of sense. Thank you. No further speakers. I will call the question. All those in favor? All those opposed? Seeing none opposed, motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Bolpitsy. Bolpitsy. Never said. Thank you, Council. So moving on from this sector, um, if we go to your top right on your handout, we've got a connected Nanaimo, equitable access and mobility, so everyone has safe, affordable and sustainable options to move and to access their daily needs. And there's several indicators here. Um, again, these are indicators that we're hoping to use, intending to use to evaluate the different scenarios. There are many others we can measure, as Councillor Gesselbart pointed out, through uh, implementation action plans. So the first one we have is transportation by mode, different trips, trips made by different forms or modes of transportation, and there's a draft target there uh, by 2041, and this links back to the active, um, the, uh, the transportation master plan. Um, and then there's a baseline there for 2016, then we have distance driven, average distance driven per person per day, 
and we've got our draft target and our baseline. So these are this is information that we have good data on and reliable data. Um, we have access to daily needs, the number of households within 400 meters to employment lands, essential services, schools, transit, recreation services, parks, and healthcare, uh, with a target to be determined. And I think this is one that um, will come out of some of the work that we're doing with you and the community around preferences for different land use scenarios. And uh, there you have, on the right-hand side, the information we have available um, currently. And then we also have growth in nodes and corridors, and I think we discussed in terms of language using different terminology, because nodes don't mean, mean a whole lot to, to many people. So growth in basically our centers and uh, corridors. A uh, portion of growth occurring in those designated areas, um, and again, we are able to do that through our GIS, and uh, those baselines would be determined um, when we have that available. We've also got uh, traffic injury rate with the number of reported crashes throughout the city and linking that to the Vision Zero target. So, Thank you. Yeah. I've got Councillor Brown. Um, yes. Uh, I would like to propose a change, and, and I think it is just a little bit more of semantics, and it's around that access to daily needs. Now, I don't exactly have the wording, but I think rather than a function of distance, it needs to be a function of time and should be within a 15-minute walk. Uh, so I would say within a 15-minute walk um, or travel with and a mobility aid to employment lands, essential services, school transit, recreation service, parks, and healthcare. Um, because 400 meters uh, doesn't always capture some of the more problematic aspects of uh, our the design in our city. So, um, while uh, and while a 15 minute walk is is being used as a metric in quite a few places now, I, but I do think it's important uh, from um, properly accessible language to also um, talk about those that need to use mobility aids. So, I would propose uh, that access to daily needs be amended to say number of households within a 15 minute walk or travel by or travel with the mobility aid to employment lands, essential services, schools, transit, recreation services, parks and healthcare. And does that if you to Ms. Gurry, does that need to be a motion or is um, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as the other changes have been a motion, if that could be Councillor Brown's motion, he would need it seconded. Okay, seconded by Councillor Hemmins. And Councillor Turley. Sorry to start again. Uh, the only question I'd have on that is not everybody walks at the same speed. So Average is it, walking. Is it, is, yeah, is it is it meaningful? I don't think so. <laughs> Do I see any further speakers? No further speakers. I'll call the question. Oh, oh. Councillor Bonner. Councillor Bonner. Oh, you showed up. I showed up. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I, I'm. Uh, Councillor Turley uh, raises a good point. Um, and I'm in favor of the motion um, because there are many places in our town, and I've given this example before, I'm within five minutes of just about everything I need. The people on the other side of my lane have to walk almost half a kilometer more because they don't have a back way to get out into the lane to get to the same place I am because of the way of the configuration of the roads. So I think that's something we should uh, be looking at. They are literally 400 meters away as well, but they can't get to it unless they walk all the way down to uh, Boxwood and come all the way back up and then all the way down Northfield. So I think it's something to consider. Thank you. Now what? Thank you, Chair. I'm just going to suggest a compromise. Why can't we just say 400 meters or a 15 minute walk? Are you open to that, Councillor Brown? Um, perhaps it could uh, be an amendment. So if Mayor Croak would like to make an amendment to um, add 400 meters or 15 minutes, 
So add 400 meters S back to so, it. So moved. Seconded by Councillor Hemmons. Councillor Brown. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, I won't be supporting the amendment because I think that just introduces the same problem that 15 minutes walk is trying to overcome. The, the problem of the or statement there is that something may be within 400 meters, but it will exceed a 15 minute walk due to problematic growth pat historic growth patterns in our city. So the, the timing metric is tends to, it ten, the 15 minutes tends to be the furthest someone will walk before they start to look for alternative modes of transformation. It has, it's not the function of the distance that's the problem. We don't travel, we don't exist in the world when we move, especially on foot by saying, you know, I could ask you how long does it take to get to Victoria? You're gonna tell me in a function of time, right? Nobody's gonna tell me exactly how many kilometers it takes to get there. So it's about putting your, ourselves in the, how we actually perceive the world. And we walk to places, um, by how long we think it's gonna take us via time. And so some of, and like I said, some of the infrastructure exists in our city that uh, you could be within 400 meters, but the, the lack of sidewalks, the way the highway cuts you off, et cetera, et cetera, um, it might show as being within that 400 meters, but it's nobody's actually gonna walk it. I think that's what this is trying to get at here is um, how do we shift the mode of people and, and we have to be putting ourselves in and how people think about these things and that's from safe completed infrastructure in relation to how long it's going to take them to actually walk or move with the mobility aid from their home to those places or, or, or travel with it amongst those places so uh, i don't think i think that's exactly the, the motion i put on the table was to get away from that so i can't support that more clause thank you i have councillor armstrong and then mayor crow Thank you. I have a concern with all of this, to be quite honest, because part of it comes into play. If you, it depends on where you live in the city, if this is even achievable. If you live in Steveson Point, if you live, if you live up in uh, Glen Oaks, uh, Rocky Point, all that, none of this is achievable. So I, I really struggle with all of this. Like I can see it for new development, but I really struggle with how we're even going to get there based on topography. Like I know many people that they certainly can walk the, the 400 meters on flat, but if you throw in a hill, then they, they can't. So I really struggle with all this, so I'm not gonna support any of it on this particular one. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Coke. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, isn't the whole point of this to aim for a more livable city in which we are more dependent on our two legs if we have them or some form of mobility device? And I appreciate uh, Councillor Brown's um, suggestion but it strikes me uh, 400 meters in 15 minutes I appreciate people look at it in terms of time but if we can't get you to walk there in 15 minutes at least if we've got you within 400 meters of where you can obtain your services that's still better than not having you within 400 meters and and the whole concept and what staff in this city have worked on for years is the nodal concept um, it's up to us to figure out how we make it effective if that's a problem and we've got commercial premises and service centers and you can't get there within 400 meters or 15 minutes and or um, then that's our problem but the fact that we get more people to that is what the measure is about surely so I'm sticking with my motion thank you no further speakers right now I believe oh Councillor Brown Sorry, just one more thing. I think this is this is fundamentally a mobility uh, issue uh, or a, a mobility concern and how it ties to land use. I agree that we definitely want to get more within a certain linear distance of, of these service areas. But what we're talking about is people moving, and it de and there is more to the equation uh, than just the actual linear distance here. And so I would ask council i would hope for your support in this to to adopt a measure of time which more and more progressive places are adopting um and, and the 15 minute neighborhood is a concept because it captures the context that matters to how people move through the urban environment it, it includes things like distance it includes things like i agree with Councillor armstrong uh, uh, our policies are never going to support 400 meters in a lot of places um, um and so 
so that's but in the places that it does um, i think we need to adopt a metric um, if for an indicator that captures the context of the urban environment anything else in my opinion is just a, it is, is is missing the mark on how we're trying to capture um, how successful we are in our policies Councillor Bonner. Thank you, um, Chair. Um, I, I agree with Councillor Brown, um, and I thought my example kind of explained that is, is if we go with 400 meters or 15 minutes, then anybody who's within 400 meters and on the other side of a highway is going to be, you know, quite literally out of luck because they're within 400 meters. I'm sorry about your luck. So um, I like the idea of, of going with time, um, and this makes more sense to me. Thank you. Sir Hammonds. Uh, thank you. I, I won't be supporting the motion and, and simply because I think when this goes out to the public, um, I'm thinking of, you know, my mom, a 15 minute walkable neighborhood probably is going to make more sense than a 400 meter designation. So for me, it's about making it clear for the residents who are going to, you know, vote and et cetera, et cetera. So I won't be supporting your motion. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further speakers, I'm going to call the question on the amendment to the motion. All those in favor? And opposed. We have Councillor Gesselbach, Councillor Hermans, Councillor Martman, Councillor Bonner, Councillor Brown opposing the amendment. So the motion fails. I counted that correctly and back to the main motion uh, and I need a reminder who made it <laughs> it was Councillor Brown. Brown thank you and the question on the main motion all those in favor Krogh, Gesselbrock, Hemmons, Martman, Thorpe and Councillor Bonner and opposed Councillor Turley Motion passes. Okay. Thank you, Council. I, I, I just want to emphasize how helpful it is to have your feedback and clarity. I know it's, it's a bit of a grind, but this is really helpful for us to have you support our work before we go out to the wider community and do the assessments. So. Um, if we can move on to, is there anything else you'd like to discuss with this list in front of you right now before we move to the bottom right quadrant and your final quadrant on the indicators? I see no further speakers. Okay. We can move on to All the right. next quadrant. Okay, so this one is the goal of an empowered Nanaimo. And I, I perhaps would like to remind you that um, these goals were grounded in our formulation of the Nanaimo Donut that was based on the strategic plan goals integrated with the United Nations goals. And so um, that's an important piece as we look at that um, in terms of also some of the language that uh, we've tried to keep the intent of. So diversity, culture, and social integrity. So everyone can thrive and have opportunities to connect and participate in a way that fulfills them. This is a tricky one for us. Uh, our Parks, Recreation, Culture Department and Social Planning Department really struggled with having tangible measures around what are often quite subjective uh, topics. So inclusion and diversity, we've got that as one flag to be determined. We know it's very important. There's many things we can do like measure, uh, program, participation and things like that. But what does it really mean in terms of the broader? So that's something that we've identified as being needed for future exploration. Investment in arts, culture and heritage, that's a fairly straightforward one. Again, it's one of those ones that you can say, but again, does it? how much does it show you progress towards different goals? But it's what one of the better ones that we thought and that coming out of the workshop with you on March 10th that we are proposing here. Participation in parks, recreation programs and services, uh, again, a number of people, the number of people in the different programs and services, uh, there's a, again, as we go down the road with other indicators, we may have supporting indicators or other indicators to add to that. And then the last one, public waterfront access. And so what you'll also see is indicators, um, length of waterfront 
and public access and a number of publicly accessible waterfront features. This one in particular relates to what the community told us in phase one was important to them, as do the other elements and goals here. So any comments or edits or suggestions for yeah. us? I have Councillor Armstrong. Thank you, I have two points. One, I'm glad you said what PRC stood for because I didn't have a clue. So I'm hoping if that goes out that that'll be put in, um, in real words so people know what it means. My second point is I would like to see reconciliation in there. I think um, when we're talking about an empowered Nanaimo, that means that there's strong partnerships with our First Nations and Indigenous peoples. So um, I would like to see that. Um, I'm not going to move it yet because I want to hear more comments, but I think um, the reconciliation piece in there would be very important. Thank you. Councillor Bonner. No? Yes. Oh, I'm uh, Mayor Crow. I want to be really provocative on the inclusion and diversity. Do we all agree what a perfect community looks like? I mean, what is a perfect community? Um, is a community that's wholly white perfect? Most people would probably say no in terms of race, racial identification. Is a community that's wholly indigenous? No. Is a community that's wholly gay, lesbian, transgendered, two-spirited, etc.? So what does it look like? And this is why when we talk about the ideals of what we're proposing, I want you to think long and hard about that. Um, if you believe that um, in terms of diversity, that, you know, is, do we go by Kinsey in terms of the percentage of the population that, that identifies as, as gay or lesbian or, or whatever the case may be? Um, does the current population of British Columbia that identifies as black, 1%, is, is that the number we're shooting for in our community if we're not there? Or do we think it should be 10% or, or whatever? I, I guess that's, I don't think we should be trying to fulfill goals if we can't decide what the goal looks like and how you would measure. And it seems to me on this one you get back to measuring. I don't know how you measure a community where people, I would hope and want to believe, will not be concerned about your race or your gender identification or, or whatever. I mean, that to me would be an inclusive and diverse community where it wasn't an issue, where it honestly, seriously didn't matter. And so how do we measure that? So I, I, I am being deliberately provocative because, again, if we're going to put something out to the public, I think everyone would say, I believe in an inclusive and diverse Nanaimo, even if they didn't believe it, because that's what a democratic, modern, liberal, progressive society wants. But what does that look like? And, it, and if it's just within the boundaries of the city and we're surrounded by other populations, is it something they, we believe they should ascribe to? If the majority of the population in West Vancouver is, you know, white and middle class, uh, do we think that's a bad community or a community that's failing to be inclusive and diverse? I mean, I, I don't know. I just, you know, I, I, if we're going to if we're going to throw out the words and we're going to ask the public to comment, I want to have some idea of what it is we think it is, and then even harder, what's the indicator? What's the target? And what's the baseline? What is what is the baseline? Honestly, I I can't answer these questions for you. I. It's like the old, I've used this one before, it's like the U.S. Supreme Court Justice who said, you know, I can't define pornography, but I know it when I see it. When I'm in a community that feels vibrant and people are talking to one another across racial lines and, and gender and all of that, you, can, you have a feel. It's like, you're, it's like your friends. You know who they are and you know they're comfortable with one another, but I'm not sure what that looks like in a city and how we're going to measure it. I don't always like being chair. <laughs> I would really like to respond, but I'll be respectful of Councillor. I have Councillor Bonner, and then I have Councillor Gesselbrock, and then I may add my two cents. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, well, as Chair, you get to have the last two cents. So, <laughs> um, The Mayor raises a good point, right? Um, to me, it's a question of when everyone believes they live an inclusive and diverse community. And that would be that belief would be different for different people. 
So if someone comes up and says, I don't believe we're, we're a diverse and inclusive community, then we probably have a, an issue. And if nobody does, we nailed it. So I, that's what would be me. I mean, it's, there's gotta be something there and then there. Your, to your point is how do you measure it, right? To me, it is, is, is more of a, this, do you feel good about your community sort of thing? Um, and that, that's where I would look at it is, is if no one's complaining, it's probably sort of okay. Councillor Gessebrook. the discussion um, at hand um, I think back of like so how do you measure different things there's sort of you know as you go back to universities like qualitative and quantitative measurements and I think things in in this section you know empowered and IMO you know there, there, there could be some subjective qualitative measures that we need to do but for me my understanding of like what we're trying to achieve in terms of inclusion and diversity is that everyone feels included in our community and feels welcomed and and that difference and diversity is, is celebrated and you know from my experience in our community and you know what we've experienced over the last year um, with black lives matter um, issues and um, in terms of um, uh, oppression of uh, members in the LGBTQ2 plus community, like I, I don't think that we're there yet and it's a very important uh, value for our community is to become more inclusive. And I, I think that there are questions of how, how do we measure our success in, in, in celebrating diversity and, um, and, and, and attracting it and also uh, achieving uh, you know a sense where nobody feels oppressed and everybody feels that they're a part of and, and can contribute um, I, I appreciate uh, Councillor Armstrong bringing up where does reconciliation uh, fit because I think it's part of this conversation and, and where does it fit within our framework and and the other um, the other uh, category or, or label that is, was part of the, the donut model and, and different frameworks as political voice. And, and, and I think that also uh, lends um, to measures or, or understanding of, in, of, of, of inclusiveness as well. Um, and so I don't know exactly how we're going to fit this in and, and how we're going to measure these things, but I think that this is the important work of, of this model and creating it and, and getting community input on it is, is how do we achieve that? And, and I'm excited about the, the creativity and, and the problem solving around this, but so I had a, I, I had a motion prepared of, 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 of putting forward of having political voice added into the, uh, the, the title with diversity, culture, and um, social integrity. Um, but with Councillor Armstrong bringing up reconciliation, it, uh, it's a whole another set of, of words and categories to figure out how to fit into this framework that it's going to take some grappling with. So I'll hold off from any motions thus far and just sort of have here others' contribution to the discussion to see where we can go from here. Thank you. Councillor Brown. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think at the end of the day, um, Diversity just comes down to representation. And there can be positive representation or negative representation. You know, so for example, uh, access to parks when you need mobility aids, access to our waterfront when you need a mobility aid, right? Those are um, inclusion and diversity questions. Um, you know, there can be negative representation, you know, the, the amount of um, or the percentage of Indigenous folks um, incarcerated compared to the general population or in, in different types of government programming. Again, it's about representation being disproportionate or or not being, or, or representation not being appropriate where it should be. So I, I agree, these are, these are hard questions to work through and develop the targets and the indicators, but, you know, it can even be think, you know, I'm not saying we have an issue, I'm just using examples is, percentage of seniors that have access to recreation program, right? These are all questions around inclusion and diversity within cities. It's not, I don't think it's a question about, you know, saying, okay, what's the, 
percentage of a certain individuals uh, from cultural backgrounds that live in BC and is it mirrored there? No, I think it's it's more than that. It's saying um, in our community, uh, do diverse individuals have equal access and inclusion rates in set parameters? Um, and and that's that's the goal. You know what what we settle on here. I, th I think these are these are interesting questions. I agree with Councillor Armstrong. I think you know around reconciliation there needs to be um i think any modern planning needs to try to to rise to the challenges of the reconciliation and calls to action and what that looks like i don't know it's easy for me to say um and council armstrong is saying i think yeah that's where staff have to unpack that a little bit so i would support that i would support the political voice um but i think we absolutely need to include have inclusion and diversity there. Um, and I, I do think it's gonna be a challenge to unpack. Uh, there might be multiple targets and multiple indicators. Um, and, uh, but I think that's, it's very important work it's just about making sure there's appropriate representation, whether it's in our facilities or whether it's through uh, governance and, and access to having political voice that, uh, that should be tracked. Um, um, and, and that way there's baselines to know if if uh, we are living up to our ideals. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Armstrong. Thank you. Um, I do want you to, to make a motion that we amend this to also include reconciliation. And if there's a seconder, I will speak to how I see it can be done. Seconded by Councillor Hammonds. Thank you. So one of, one of the thoughts I was looking at, you know, obviously, I think what we need to do is we need to engage with our Indigenous people and, and, and Sinaitic First Nation and have them be part of the process as to what are the indicators they see, uh, what are the targets they would like to have instead of just us doing it. And I think that's the way that we move this forward is the engagement with our First Nations partners. And, it, and there's many of them within the community as well as uh, Sinaitic First Nation. And that's how we can move the reconciliation piece forward as well as we can also look at the TRC and what our within our realm as a, a municipal government to implement. So I think there are ways that we can look at the reconciliation piece, but for me, the most important part is that it doesn't come from us. It comes from conversations with our Indigenous partners and Sinaitic First Nations. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Gessenbrock and then Mayor Croak. Um, I think this, draws in the, the question of, of how this will go out for, for public feedback. Um, I think that um, one way forward is, is how we could um, get feedback on how to move forward from uh, the communities that this would be uh, addressing is if we do add, like, sort of under the category an empowered Nanaimo, there's like diversity, culture, and social integrity, um, potentially um, add reconciliation um, as, as one of those uh, titles, maybe even add political voice, and then have uh, a couple elements open of, of a draft indicator and, and um, a target uh, that are just left open, like to be determined, that we can get input on on you know what what are we trying to attract and achieve here and, and see what the community. Um, has to say about that or specific stakeholders that we're engaging with because um, uh, yeah potentially um, Sinemuk or, or or other individuals and in, in indigenous community could uh, would have comment on this and say for political voice uh, the, the neighborhood associations or whoever might have comment of potential areas that we could go to and um, I think the this will be an ongoing discussion as we sort out the the donut model sort of in conjunction, but as, as a, a, a parallel stream to the actual land use planning. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Crow. Thank you very much, Chair. And, and um, I, I, with great respect to my colleagues around this table today, I don't know that you've really addressed some of the difficulties that I have suggested around this whole issue. When you talk about inclusion and diversity, um, Councillor Brown pointed out a simple one in some respects, you know, can people with mobility issues get access to our parks? Uh, can they get to the pool? Can they get onto the arena? I mean, I think that, that that's an important question. You may be able to measure that. But in terms of representation, he said, you know, we want to live up to our ideas. I'm not sure what those, uh, those ideas are. 
I look around this table and I would argue there is not a poor person represented at this council table. Every one of us owns a piece of real estate or has an interest in land. We all own vehicles. Uh, pretty much all of us, I think, have a post-secondary education of some form. How do you, is it important? Does the community want to have somebody at this table who is on social assistance and has been for a long time? Point of order, but we do have a motion on the table and I'm wondering if you're speaking to the motion. Um, the motion is that. Recon reconciliation. Reconciliation. I'll, I'll hold my remarks till later, but let's talk about reconciliation then. What does that mean? Is it reconciliation um, in terms of just indigenous people or is it rec reconciliation arguably in terms of the diverse peoples who live in our community who have been uh, victims of racial discrimination as well? Uh, reconciliation, I think, in terms of the community, does it mean that this council isn't doing its job because we don't have, well, we do have Councillor Bonner in fairness, who's, who's got status now. But do we have someone who uh, is a member of the local indigenous community in the, in the sense of Sinemic First Nation at this table? I don't know. I, uh, I, again, what does it look like and how are you going to measure it? And I'm not dismissing the importance of it, but I just think if we're going to set out that this is important, I want to know how you're going to measure it and what does it mean and what does it look like? Because I'm not sure that if we can't answer it, I'm not sure the community can either. Councillor Thorpe. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, so, um, to uh, first of all, uh, I'll speak in favor of the uh, the motion on the floor, but also in more general terms, uh, I'm not sure to Mayor Krogh's comment that we need to have an answer before we, we go don't. to the community and ask what their answer is. And, I, and I'm sorry if I keep coming back to this, but I want to hear what the public has to say, not to impose something on the public. Here's what we see as an inclusive society or a diverse society. I want to hear what people in the public see as what they would uh, uh, identify as indicators of those qualities. And what, do they, what does reconciliation mean to them? I want to hear different viewpoints. What does diversity in our society mean to members of the public? Let's, let's hear what they have to say. And then the next step beyond that, I think, is what can we as a city do uh, to move towards some of the goals that the public identify? So it's not us imposing our views. It's asking for the views of the public, examining them, and then deciding how we can move towards those. So again, I'll, I'll support the, the, uh, the uh, motion uh, because I think that is part of inclusion and diversity, but I don't feel that we need to further define what we Thank think you. is di uh, diversity or inclusion. I want to hear what the public thinks. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Thorpe. Councillor Armstrong, you still have a hand up? You're muted. I agree with what, what Councilor Thorpe says. This is supposed to be what the public says. You know, we're, 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 we're throwing all of our personal stuff on and the whole purpose of this is to gather information back from the community is what is their take and what are their thoughts on these issues. So, and then from there, if we have to start to find how we, we do our deliverables and targets, that's when we do it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Turley. These, some of these we've talked about today will evolve and change as you go out and talk to the community. Some will change after our reimagine the IMO process is done. And I would see this very much as a living document that you're going to continue to work on. I would say today, the, the ones that are um, probably going to be of the most interest and will get the most feedback from the community on are those that are actually having implications into the land use scenarios, which is really the land use scenarios are what we're going back out to ask the community about in this next phase. And I would um, it's probably oversimplifying it, but I would describe this as a decision-making tool to help 
council and the community when they're evaluating those scenarios. So some of these will be more easily translated to a, a land use plan than others. Some will get feedback through this process and these indicators and targets will evolve. Some might take a process that's beyond this um, land use process that we're in right now. Um, it might take a longer conversation with the community, but I think what's important is if council thinks it's an important element that we put it in there now and it sends a message to the community that maybe we don't have the answer on, but we're open and wanting to get feedback from the community on, on completing that work. Thank you. Is that it? Yeah. Thank you. I see no further speakers, so I will call question on the motion. All those in favor? All those opposed? Opposed is Councillor Turley. Motion passes. And I, I um, the main motion as amended, that was the amendment you voted on, um, on adding reconciliation, so that was the amendment. So now the main motion as amended. The main motion what? as amended. Well, what, 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 what's well, the main motion? May we have it read out, please? Yes, um, that the, the, the title, an empowered Nanaimo, diversity, culture, and social integrity, um, the amendment was to add reconciliation. So it will now read, um, if the main motion as amended passes, an amended, an empowered Nanaimo, diversity, cultural, culture, culture, reconciliation, and social integrity. Thank you. Call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. And I just wanted to add my two cents to the conversation about um, inclusion and diversity. First of all, we do have a committee, so I'm hoping that we would get feedback from the committee of um, what kind of indicators or targets we are looking at at being inclusive. But when I think of an inclusive city, uh, I think more along the lines just from personal experience around racism. And I think of an inclusive city as one that does not have bus stops that have racial slurs on them. I look at a city that raises awareness with all their citizens, that has uh, community programs that raise awareness of diversity. I think we were very successful in our pride parade two years ago, and it made my heart warm that we were such a diversified city and, and proud to be out there and celebrate whoever we are in our community. But I think the city also needs to lead the way to say this is a city we live in and that we are inclusive and we are accepting and we will build that city to be that way. So that's my two cents. Moving on. We have no further speakers oh. to this one. Or? Councilor Gessebrock. Thank you. Um, and uh, appreciating that staff had to integrate together uh, multiple uh, frameworks into this and um, the need for, uh, you know, where, where do you fit a different category? But um, now with reconciliation added into the list of um, elements uh, or describing what empowered Nanaimo is, um, I would like to move to add a uh, political voice uh, to that list. And um, seconded by Councillor Hemmons. Did you want to speak further to that, Councillor Gessebra? Uh, I do think it is a, um, you know, looking at the original donut model and um, and even the, the ones that have been adapted at other uh, municipalities, but um, having uh, the ability to have your perspective heard and, and, and represented and your say on uh, decisions that are impacting you is an important um, element of a social foundation. And um, I do think that uh, we, we need to, um, to speak to that. And uh, the, the motion that I would like to move uh, actually is... Um, Excuse me, I think you already made a motion. 
And yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't, my, my motion was a little bit more specific than it, it kind of happened a little bit quicker than I was anticipating there. I, I, I did, I do have a, a full motion, one that adds it and also requests for a, you know, a, an indicator to be developed around it, um, which I think would be more appropriate. Uh, so I, it kind of happened a little bit quicker, uh, the, the seconding than I intended. Do you wish to withdraw that motion? I'll, I'll withdraw that motion and, and uh, and, and move the, 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 the full motion. Um, I, if there's agreement from the seconder. Thanks. Thank you. Motion is withdrawn. Councillor Gesselbrock. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to move that within the category of empowered and IMO that political voice gets added to the subcategory um, diversity, culture, uh, reconciliation, and social integrity, and that an indicator is developed to track citizen access, participation, and city uh, decision making. Seconded by Councillor Hemmings. Mayor Croak. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I, I suppose you could argue that indicator of political voice would be maybe the number of people that vote, but that's a choice. Uh, political voice, political voice for who? Me as an individual, me as a white middle-class senior male, me as a a gay 19-year-old student, um, me as a new immigrant, me as a whatever, all of the diversity of these peoples. And this, this is where I find these questions a bit tricky. Me as a richer person or a poorer person? Like, what does political voice mean? Because there is this, and I find this to be one of the troubling assumptions that are being made about discourse in societies everywhere now that somehow because you're part of a group identified by race, gender, orientation, income potentially not as much anymore, that seems to have faded and most people don't think about that, but I defy you to tell me in a given community, even if it's entirely composed of one race or religious group, that money doesn't count for stuff anymore and level of education doesn't count for, for something. I, I, I want to know what, what do you mean by political voice? It, does it get back to the idea of representation? And if so, is it representation based on the existing numbers of whoever you identify with in the community? Or is it identification on the basis of what you think is an ideal? What does that political voice mean? Again, if you're, uh, we can fall back on the argument that's been used many times today. I've used it myself. This is, and, and Councillor Thorpe and Armstrong have been particularly strong on this issue today. Uh, we're supposed to hear from the community, but I, I guess I want to know what does political voice mean? Does it mean you feel satisfied before the election or after the election? Does it mean you feel satisfied with your level of participation or your opportunity to address counsel? What, what does political voice mean? So I, if, if someone can sort of give me something that gives me comfort that we're putting out something that people in this community can actually understand and relate to, I'll be happy to hear it. Councillor Hemmings. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And for this response, I'm going to draw on my work with the Community Engagement Task Force. And I think it was well explored through that group. Political voice means do people know who represents them, how to reach them, and do they feel heard when they reach out? And I think um, some of the work that we did with that task force was literally making a list of here are the ways that you can engage with council. And the, you know, I. I a huge portion of those ways that you can engage with your city aren't well known. And so political voice is about communicating. Um, did you know you can call the mayor? You can call any councillor at this table and they'll pick up the phone for you. And when they do pick up the phone, do, do you feel heard as a citizen? So for me, political voice is really about, I mean, it, it's, it's about voter turnout. It's about, um, do people understand that we work for them, that this government works for them? And when they come and talk to us about their concerns and their hopes, et cetera, do they feel heard and those, those perspectives reflected in our decision making as their government? So I'm not sure how staff would, would kind of drop indicators towards that, but I actually think it's, it's a little bit easier than what you're discussing um, your worship with all due respect I think it's it's do, do people know how they can reach out to their government do they feel heard when they do so thank you councillor Hammonds councillor Bonner thank you chair um, this actual 
piece of suggestion actually came from the public. I, I remember seeing an email on it uh, recently. So I, I'd definitely be uh, interested in, in having it in there. I would look to the public to see what they, uh, you know, let, let's go out to them and see what they think about it. Um, that, that's about all I have to say on it. I just, I'm, I'm floored by the, uh, the mayor's comments all throughout this meeting and, and uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know what you're drinking lately, but it's, uh, you're, you're having very interesting conversations. <laughs> I don't see. Uh, the, the, I'm, hmm. Oh, Mayor Cole. Councillor Bonner, I say this with all due respect. I said uh, several times today it is about being provocative and making people think about what they're really talking about. I've heard a lot of language today that's very popular and, and in vogue and used over and over again by people, but I'm just a practical guy trying to get us to focus on what does that language mean? Councillor Hemmings just gave a pretty reasonable answer about political voice. If it's just about citizens understanding how they get a hold of the mayor or council, that's something we might be able to measure. But it seems to me an awful lot of what we've discussed today has amounted to uh, what something that would require sophisticated public opinion polling. And we all know about polls and what Diefenbaker said about them. Polls are for dogs, and there's some truth to that. And I just, I just want to come out of this process understanding what it is that and what kind of community people want. And if that requires me to be provocative and the suggestion I'm drinking something odd, which I haven't today, although after a council meeting like today, I might <laughs> feel like I need a drink. Uh, so be it, but I just, um, I want to see something that's real at the end of this, that people can relate to and understand and helps them recognize that hopefully this council has their best interest, whatever we may conceive that to be, in mind uh, when we're doing this work, as opposed to talking about things that don't really relate or have much meaning. So that's the stuff that I'm talking about. And it's, yes, it's controversial because I want it to be provocative because there is too much language thrown out with too much ease and assumptions made about people that, that um, I just find disturbing as somebody who's tried to pay attention throughout my life to the diversity of opinions that exist in my community. Uh, you, the, the, the climate denier may be a social activist. The anti-vax, the anti-vaxxer may be the person who will run into your house and pull you out of the fire at great risk to their life, but won't take a vaccine to ensure that you don't get the virus. So anyways, yeah, I'm being provocative and if I'm drinking something, no, I'm not. <laughs> but I, I, uh, I do want to emphasize that if this is the kind of debates we're going to have around this table, then you've got to be prepared to talk about this stuff because at the end of the day, it has to have meaning. And those poor folks over there whose mics haven't always worked well today have to make this work for the people of Nanaimo if that's what the people of Nanaimo want or we want or we decide we're going to do. In any event, see, you're even more provocative by asking me what I'm thinking. So that's what I'm thinking. If I haven't articulated it well, we could have many more hours of discussion, but the good people of Nanaimo, I'm sure, have heard enough of me this afternoon. Thank you. Councilor Thorpe. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'll, I'll support uh, the motion. I, I don't I don't personally care for the term political voice. Um, to me, that, that sounds too political. Uh, but if I am correct in what I believe, it's really just another term for public engagement. Yeah. And uh, who's going to argue against that? I think the word that uh, struck me a minute ago, the word we've been missing here in our discussion is the word opportunities. And I think what we need to be investigating through this reimagine process is hearing from the public what do they see as opportunities for the city to move forward in areas such as uh, public engagement. 
how can we how can we make that possible for them? Personally, I think we I think we do a tremendous job of encouraging public engagement already. I think there's tons of opportunities for public engagement, and I sometimes wonder what more we can do to advertise those. Uh, but thinking back to inclusiveness and diversity again, it's it, it's well, what can we do to provide opportunities for those things? So if it's an opportunity for people to express their voices and opinions, then I'm gonna support it. Uh, as to whether or not they feel heard, I always find that that uh, comes down to whether or not they get their way or not. And if the vote goes against them, then the complaint is, well, I wasn't heard. Well, sometimes people can be heard, but sorry, uh, there was a better argument the other way. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Thurk. If we have no further speakers before I call the question. Um, I'm going to support the motion because as Councillor Thorpe and others have stated, this is going out to the community. So we're getting feedback and I'm, I'm happy to do that. Uh, the political voice, I look at it more as a public voice uh, and the communi or a community voice. I'm uncomfortable with the words political voice, but for now, since this is the beginning, I will support it. So I'll call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? Are you opposed, Councillor Brown? No, I'm in favor, but I was trying to was trying to speak. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. That's that's okay. I will be very quick. Um, I think to me, political voice, I think, is just part of a, a larger thing around, like, just civically engaged. And, mm -hmm. you know, I would love to see something like that, but I'm happy to support it. Thank you. So I believe the motion did pass. Unanimous. Thank you. Mr. Lindsay. Thank you, Madam, Madam Chair. Just um, for clarification, I think, and maybe for our benefit is, so the motion is passed, we'll see the element added of, um, of political voice um, with to be determined under the indicators. So in terms of our next step of going out here in the next few weeks, which Ms. Bolpulsing will, will go over here in a moment about what, where we're moving with in the short term on land use scenarios and an official community plan, um, we wouldn't necessarily see uh, that as an opportunity to get the community's feedback on this question. I think there's a, there's a separate process possibly here at play. We could certainly report back to council with a report on options on how on what an indicator could be around political voice. Um, you've talked about some of them today. We have some other ideas of how that how that could be framed up, but I don't see that necessarily being back in front of this okay. committee or council before we go okay. to the community on the land use scenarios. But acknowledge that we do have to have that discussion. And we will bring back something for count, for council and the committee to consider. Thank you. Okay. I think we have wrapped up Reimagine for today. Oh, Councillor Gesselbrot. Um, I, I think that is the, the question. I just wanted to hear a little bit more clarity on sort of the, the actual engagement process of what we are bringing forward to the community um, for engagement on. Because um, I, I understand that there's, you know, the large focus is on the land use scenarios and getting feedback on that. Um, I, I'm curious just with the with the donut I mean a large part of the, the purpose is to be able to represent a, a bit of a vision um, for the community and also get feedback on that vision um, which will has some influence on the land use thing we're using the donut to monitor it but it will have uh, impact on sort of the the other suite of policies that will be part of the OCP maybe not specifically um, regarding land use itself, but my understanding the OCP does include other policy directions within it. And so I'm just curious, how, what are we, what, how are we engaging the community in the donut in this round? Is it purely informational? Are we eliciting feedback on some of the categories or the, the, the targets and indicators? Uh, so, Madam Chairman, I think this is a perfect segue to get to the actual heart of what we wanted to talk to Council right. about today was really this next step. And, and I think maybe Ms. Ms. Popolsi will go over it, but if I was quickly going to describe it, I would say that each of the scenarios, and, and you're right, I'm, over, I'm oversimplifying it when I say it's a land use policy document. It's far more than that. 
Um, but when we go out to the community and, um, and ask these questions on each of these scenarios, the, the idea that people would have a sense on, well, if you pick scenario A, it, it, it achieves some of these targets better than others. Scenario B might meet some of the targets. So again, it's a decision-making tool to say which of these scenarios use, you know, meet the targets and indicators that this council's established. It doesn't mean that council, or the, sorry, that the community will only give feedback based on these indicators. The community might not even, you know, in their own input might a community member might not even consider this and say well regardless of all of this i have issues around this land use policy that i i want to provide this comment on or this direction on so it's going to be open and there's going to be an opportunity for people to uh, comment beyond the donut but certainly the donut will be there and um, the indicators that have been picked will be available to people so that they can at least have some idea of how each scenario meets the objectives Okay, so we're on to another exciting chapter, Green Engine. So thank you very much for helping us clarify and pass those motions because previously, uh, going from May 10th, because we didn't have any motions, we were going with what we had. So very grateful to you, for you to helping us do that because it's really important before we go out in phase three. So um, these are the key things that we're communicating to the community as part of phase three. They will have seen this in phase one, but a reminder, why are we doing what we're doing? Yes, we've got the draft goals, and we're also looking at what's our planning context? What are we anticipating in the future in terms of employment growth and also population growth and the impacts and the demands on our residential, commercial, industrial, and institutional land uses, as well as our parks and natural areas. So that's an important piece. And as you're aware, as the steering committee, we had to come up with some meaningful options for the community to look at. So going back to them again, as uh, Mr. Lindsay said, getting input on the overall goals and feedback on that, the indicators, likely we're presenting them in the version of the city portrait. What you've got here is what we told you we try and do, similar to how Cornwall showed their city portrait and making that linkage for people so they, they see the um, linkages between the draft goals and then how that fits, that those draft goals fit with the donut economics framework and then the indicators. So they have an opportunity to give feedback in different sections. And most importantly, how those then translate into the land use scenarios and what that means for the different options. So on a very high level for the community, what they, you can see here is the bubble diagrams, but we'll be giving people the opportunity to give feedback on the different scenarios with the idea that it's made clear that it's not one or the other, but what elements of the different scenarios do they like? So it gives us the opportunity to knit together a draft scenario to go back to them again with phase three. So the important thing is the community has given us their input in phase one quite extensively. We've taken that and we've used that and we've had your support to develop what we go back out to them in phase two. And in addition to the scenarios, as Council Gesselbart was pointing out, there are some important key scenarios or directions that are less focused on land use and how do we get that feedback. So we again will be breaking up our survey opportunities. This is going to be um, fairly complex, but I'll tell you a little bit about how we're evolving with testing that out. Um, and doing what's called strategy sheets where for different sectors whether it's active transportation um, social equity uh, climate change where there are things that are non land use that people have the opportunity to give their preferences for different directions so we can use that to confirm the wording of the policies that we give back to the community and yourselves in phase three so um, you will have seen a draft version of that we had a very lengthy session with you uh, as the steering committee um, with what we're proposing to go out with. So just so you know, because this is fairly complex information, we are testing it out. We have uh, some groups, uh, workshops with some high school students next week. And also we're going to test run it with some staff internally who are not currently engaged in planning to see if between the work of grades between eight to 12 leadership groups and student councils, if we can't make ourselves clear to them, 
we know we need to tweak our engagement materials. We do also hope to work with Literacy Nanaimo, uh, who did review some of our materials in the past, to again make sure we have a level of different ways that people can communicate and, and give feedback. So the idea is that we let people know if you've got just a few minutes to spare and you only want to give feedback on the goals, this is your survey. If you want to get in more depth and you feel like reading 30 pages of detail, we've got this and we've got a spectrum of opportunities and we found that worked quite well for us in phase one and we hope to do that again in phase two. So that, I guess I've, and now I'm gonna give you a little bit on the engagement timeline. So we're looking at trying to launch around June 23rd. Uh, it might be a little bit later depending on how we test run and then COVID safe doing a variety of different outreach methods, including providing community members with the opportunity to sign up for detailed workshops. So for example, we know that simply saying to somebody, hey, read all this background information, give us feedback, may not work for some people. They may want to get in good back and forth with staff. So giving a range of um, Zoom workshops they can attend and spend up to 90 minutes with staff, giving feedback with us, giving the opportunity to explain uh, the different land use scenarios. So, and also with the online survey. So this is our timeline right now. It could change, uh, but this is what we're aiming for. And we hope with COVID, right now we're planning online workshops, but depending on how things go, we're willing to adapt to other forms of engagement. Um, so here's a range, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but this is the variety of ways we are letting people know that this is going on. And uh, yourselves as our steering committee were amazing in helping us get the word out during phase two, uh, phase one. and. So we're using many of the same techniques we did before. Gratitude to the RDN for letting us put things in the buses again, because again, that again gets that out in a wide way. And we'll continue to use the efforts of the Parks, Recreation, and Culture Department in their outdoor uh, pop-ups and opportunities to co-have uh, opportunities to get reimagined out in the community. So that is the um, overall framework we're using. And as I said, with phase one, you had the highest level of system engagement that a community planning process for the city has ever had, including over 50% who are new to engaging with our community. So we really hope to do that. And um, you know, we've also had great collaboration with the school district, which we want to continue BIU, and also uh, really upping our promotion through the regional library as well this time around. So that is where we're at. So wrapping up, this is where we are in phase two. And uh, this is, I can see you're here at the June 14th GPC that should be highlighted here. We're coming back to you on the 28th with a detailed session with Parks, Recreation, Culture. And that's where you'll see examples of how we're going to frame up some of those questions around policy that are less land use oriented, but more program oriented that influence other elements of sustainability in the donut. And so with that, I will pause. Thank you very much. So first I have Councillor Armstrong, then Councillor Brown, then Councillor Thorpe. And just a question on the engagement. You know, you say you're going out to grade eights and twelves, many who don't have a clue about government or what who's responsible, whatever. Have you any given any co uh, consideration to going to talk to some of our seniors? There's many groups out there that I'm sure would love to be involved, especially after COVID, it would give them something to feel a purpose about. And especially as many have been homeowners, they've been through many different cycles of life. So I think that would be a great group to go and see how the two compare. Uh, through Councilor Marvin, yes. uh, through the chair to Councilor Armstrong, uh, we would go out to the seniors as we did in phase one to engage them as part of the overall community and either groups can coordinate individual Zooms through their groups, if they can get a larger group together, or they can participate in one of the various Zoom sessions we plan to offer. Is that what you were thinking? No, my question was, would you look at them as one of the test groups? Ah. I mean, it's fine to go to the schools, but these kids have no idea of the concepts mm -hmm. of, of the real world. So, you know, great, it's gonna be, we're gonna get like some, you know, some ideas, but it's not based in reality. Whereas many of our seniors have lived throughout, you know, 
depressions, COVID now, pandemics, whatever, you know, and, and that's, I think, a, a, an area that we're sadly not going to enough. Thank you. Councillor Brown. Uh, thanks, Your Worship. Or thanks, Madam Chair. Um, question I had is, I, you know, I want to say maybe 18 months ago now, um, maybe longer, um, Council passed the motion to work with Guardian and the school district to engage with uh, the youth to actually find out how they want to be engaged with. Um, and I'm just wondering, is that done and is it informing this process? Okay, uh, through the chair to Councillor uh, Brown. So that is still in the works. I think it's now been tasked to our Parks, Recreation and Culture Department. And what we're doing is because Reimagine is taking a fairly strong youth focus, we're using this opportunity to ask the students, because we're going to them, we're not asking them to come to us, asking them what works for them, what do they suggest, how do they like to be engaged, and asking those questions through Reimagine will be supportive of the overall youth engagement strategy. So that's uh, how we're planning to add and collaborate on that piece through Reimagine. And uh, okay. just, so, just, so, just so I'm clear, the motion has sort of been wrapped up into the reimagined process and is getting done that way? Uh, I, I, what I was saying is we're, we are integrating, um, providing that information, supporting that motion. We're not taking it over per se, but we know that we have the opportunity to do very broad engagement because of the resources and staff that we have. And rather than duplicate effort, we have the opportunity so right now, um, and by the way, with the by going to the broader groups, um, like the whether it's the leadership or the student council, many of them do tend to be grade eight and up, but they're often open to grade eights and younger. Um, that we hope to get. We've got three scheduled next week, and I'm not sure how many the following week. Um, so it's an opportunity to ask them what works. Um, and how they wish to be engaged going forward. Now that is one sector of youth um, under the age of 18. And uh, then there's opportunities for us to also have those conversations with the um, other youth who are post-secondary or um, yeah, under the age of 25, I guess. Okay, thanks so much. And, and I was really pleased in the mayor's task force when they told me that uh, youth went all the way up to 34 all of a sudden. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no, under 25 makes sense. Thanks so much for that, uh, Ms. Paul Pulsing. I think it's probably a great, great, great uh, process to actually get the feedback through. So thanks for the efforts on that. Thank you. Councillor Thorpe. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Following up on, on both of those uh, comments, I think, um, first of all, yes, I'm glad that we're, uh, we're uh, looking to uh, hear what youth have to say. Uh, 34, I think it's very young, but um, I think that is valuable, but also also to Councillor Armstrong's comments, and I, and I won't be quite as uh, as uh, judgmental on our uh, grade grade eight students. I think some of them are very well aware of what's going on in the community. However, uh, I, I was a little bit surprised when I read through the the timeline here, and I saw um, uh, reference to School District 68, reference to VIU, reference to digital outreach, and so on, and then and then specifically uh, a slide or a frame that said youth and student outreach. And to me, that doesn't seem inclusive of uh, the majority of our citizens who fall into a totally different demographic. So if we're going to be specifically outreaching, uh, reaching out to uh, youth, then my question would be, why are we not specifically targeting and reaching out to the seniors, uh, certainly to our business community who would be very interested in land use issues and also have more uh, uh, experience with the world, as Councillor Armstrong said, than some of our younger residents. So hopefully you can help me with that. Absolutely, through the chair to Councillor uh, Thorpe. Thorpe. <laughs> I, I nearly hyphenated your name to Thorpe Brown. Um, so <laughs> the reason why we did, so the rest of the engagement is broadly inclusive of the wider demographic of the community. And if you'll recall from our statistically valid survey, which we'll be doing again, and our outreach, we had good representation in our um, older 
demographic age groups, which is, is fairly common with planning processes. Uh, partly it's factors of time, partly it's factors of um, education and awareness. And so just because we have one slide doesn't mean we're being exclusive of the other demographics. So I say that respectfully to the millennials and to other categories. Uh, with the youth and student engagement, one of the things we saw was we that was the group in phase one who had the lowest representation vis-a-vis -vis our census data. And so we thought we would, for council's purposes, try and raise that up to be representative like the rest of the community was represented in phase one. So, um, so my apologies if it appeared we were leaving seniors and other age demographics out. That wasn't the case. The rest of the slides are, are meant to and intended to reach those groups through different media. And so, for example, we are ensuring last time we ensured that there were paper copy surveys available for people. We even had staff dropping off stuff to people's doors if they couldn't come and pick it up. Um, we'll continue to provide that accessibility and also um, making sure we have print media as well as traditional online media. So I hope that answers your question. No, it does, and I thank you for clarifying that. Uh, I was confident that there would be an answer along those lines, but uh, I know that uh, seniors do love to have political voice, and they like <laughs> to be heard, so I'm sure they will have that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Thorpe. Councillor Gessebrock. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I just had a, a question regarding communication of the donut model. Um, in the slideshow, uh, there was a slide. I don't know if I saw it on this one, but in our package, there was sort of a, an image, and it was just a short explanation of what the donut was. Um, is that going to be a communication tool put out to the public? Through the chair to council guest part? Yes, it is. OK, great. Um, if so, there, there was sort of a key concept with the donut framework that I do think um, is important to have included in that. And, it, and it, it's subtle, but I think it's one that uh, I think it's important that we message on because it does impact um, a, a better understanding of why we're making the decisions we are around reducing GHG emissions, solid waste, and you know our procurement strategy. And that is um, just to have the language in about um, the the taking responsibility for our impacts outside of our borders on the environment and um, on the well-being of others. And um, I think that adding one or two words in um, uh, to that would, would, would communicate that. So um, just to, to make it clear, uh, I've got a motion that, that can reflect that. And um, it's... Uh, uh, I, I move to add language in the donut messaging conveying environmental responsibility for our impact on our environment both locally and globally and to add language in the donut messaging conveying social responsibility for well-being of people both inside and our borders and our impacts outside. So however, that's, oh, let's, I move that. There's a motion on the floor. Do I have a seconder? Seconded. Councillor Hemmings for discussion. Great. Uh, yeah, just so that that messaging is in there. Um, and however, staff decide to, to incorporate that, it's sort of a central tenant of the, the model. And I think that the way things have gone, it's, we're more focused on sort of our, our local impacts, which is good. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'd like to have that included. So thank you. I'm seeing no further speakers. So through myself to you. It, you're basically saying um, act locally, think globally, correct? Aren't we already doing that? We're, we're, do, we're doing it. I just There's a slide specifically on how we're communicating to the public, explaining what the donut model is. And um, basically, uh, you know, the, 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 the main um, vision of the donut model is um, that, um, you know, Nanaimo is a thriving community. Uh, uh, that uh, in a thriving place that uh, um, that respects the well-being of, of others, all, all other people, and the health of the whole planet. And so it's just sort of in that donut, in the city portrait methodology, there's that those quadrants of like global social, global ecological, uh, uh, local social, local ecological, and just 
making sure that we are including that global perspective, our, taking responsibility for our impacts outside of our borders, both environmentally and socially, in the messaging that we're conveying out to the community of when we're explaining what the donut is. So that, in this process of reimagining Nanaimo, this engagement process, my understanding is we're introducing the donut and explaining how we're using it as a guide to like select our land use scenarios and just making sure that in the communication material that orientation to our global taking responsibility to our global impacts is included and it just it wasn't clear in the, the material okay. that i read so thank you i see no further speak oh mayor crow we've motivated you uh, yes thank you very much chair and and i i appreciate what Council Gesserbrock's trying to say, and um, I'm more inclined to agree with the comments of the chair around uh, acting locally and thinking globally. I mean, that's really what it gets down to, but I, I, I must express some concern uh, around the promotion of the donut, which is a, essentially a very idealistic statement. I don't have a problem with high ideals, but I am concerned and I'm going to vote against this and lose. I'm well conscious of that simply because I th think it's a important for us to step back for a moment and recognize that we're the city of Nanaimo and yes, we may be a leader in having adopted the donut model and all of those things, but I just have a sneaking feeling that some of the folks out there who are paying attention to the debate or what we're doing may be seeing us as talking about topics that we believe are important and emphasizing our virtue and, and, and our idealistic view of where we want to go when they're really interested in whether or not they get access to the swimming pool next week or the parks or whether the water continues to arrive safely and their sewers work and those kinds of things and and so i'm i'm just i'm just throwing this out that as we talk about all of these things and and emphasize and pass motions around it um that we're kind of losing touch to some extent with what we're elected to do as members of city council. And I'm not saying you step back and let the world go to hell in a handbasket, that you not express your concerns and views, but I, I do sometimes feel that we are losing sight of the job that we're elected to do at this level of government in this time and place. And, and frankly, I'd support a statement that said, we hope Nanaimo will act locally and think globally, but I, I, I'm not sure what value is, is given to this document by the addition of that language around the donut model. So I'd be happy to hear a little more debate, but I'm, I'm not convinced that this moves us forward in terms of encouraging community participation or assisting citizens in understanding what we're trying to achieve. Thank you. Before I do have another first time speaker, Councillor Hemmins and Councillor Gessebach, but first Ms. Gurry, and I'm assuming we might be not having another item on the agenda. Oh, you can definitely assume <laughs> that, but, and we can talk about it when you're done this. I just wanted to make sure um, that all of um, Council is aware of the slide I believe Council Gesselbrock is speaking to, and it's on page 22 of your agenda. So it is the city portrait of the um, donut. Just so for some context when, um, for the language that Council Gesserbrock has moved that is included into that tool page explaining 22? it. Yeah, so page 22 of your original agenda, the reimagine and I'mo slide, it shows the, the, um, t the model, for the Nanaimo model. Oh, I see. Yeah, he's speaking to the language. Yeah, the, in the circle. This is it on page twenty-two. I'm seeing, I'm seeing page three of the slide presentation. Okay. That's helpful. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Okay. That's correct. You're sorry. You're correct. Yeah. I can pull it up on the screen if the PowerPoint's put back up. Speaking to it though, I'll, I'll go to Councillor Hemmins next. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm, 
now that I'm looking at this, I was going to argue against the motion simply because it's the same, for me, it's the same as the 400 meter versus the 15 minute neighborhood. And I think it's about clarity for residents. And if we're asking for their feedback, they have to, I feel like they have to really understand and own what we're, what we're talking about. And I think um, the concept of think uh, globally, act locally is embedded in the donut. That is the donut. Um, because we're talking about the ecological ceiling. So I'm not, I, I'm just not convinced yet that we need to, to do anything more with that. And I think to push into that could risk alienating some residents who feel that, well, wait a minute, this is our city plan. Why are we talking about these global things? I think mm -hmm. the, the, the concept of the ecological ceiling for me feels kind of at the limit of where we can bring the community to say, you know, we're, we're contextualizing our plans in a greater kind of global piece. But I, I would, I, I'm cautious about leaning into that too heavily. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gessebrock. Guys, we're way overthinking this. Like, I, I hate having to bring a formal motion on this thing. Like, the whole model just the same about thinking globally, acting locally, like about taking responsibility for our global impacts. And it's like literally, we'd be adding one word of, of like you know, living within our means, minimizing the harm we do to our natural environment locally and globally and, and, and doing the same for the social. And, and it is important reminder to people that, you know, why we're focusing on waste reduction is because of supply chains and the effect that it has on consumption outside of our borders. And this is important information to like reinforce to people. Same with greenhouse gas emissions. It's not just in our borders. And, and people need to know that. We have policies in place that are, are are lowering our greenhouse emissions because of the global contributions to these things. And the same with our social procurement policy. Why do you have, a, have an equity clause in your social procurement policy? How does that affect jobs and lands? Well, actually, we want to be mindful that when we're sourcing particular equipment, um, that is not being done in a sweatshop you know, in, a, in a developing country. We put that language in so that we so that we have justification and bring awareness of the decisions that we are making. And, and we need to continually be messaging, messaging that as leaders. And that's what this is. And so it's, it's a minor tweak to the model that when we're giving the definition explanation, those few little words are added to there. Probably will have a, you know, a small, but it is a significant uh, acknowledgement of what we're, what we're trying to do. And I, I think that just in service of the whole model that that's part of the definition of uh, of what this model is. Like it's very clear in the vision statement, and this is what we're messaging. So I, I, I hope to have council's support on these very little minor tweaks. It's not going to overly complicate or confuse people, and like it is partly understanding. Like if when we look at how the actual model was developed, we have kind of glazed over a little bit that aspect of the city portrait process, where we go through and ask what is our city's commitments to our, our global impacts on uh, social equity and the social foundation. What is our city vision and goals? Because we didn't have time to go do that, because we were com compressed, we kind of like integrated in a way where we're not spending time on it. But it is an important part, and I think that we can just allude to that so that it sets us up further down the road to, to expand on that understanding of like how is Nanaimo going to take responsibility for the impacts of our consumption patterns or the impacts of, 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 of our operating outside of our borders because we can't just solely be focused on Nanaimo itself, you know, just inside our, the, the environment that's within our city border here or on the people because we don't operate that way. And that's part of the problem, I think, is that we get very focused on, you know, all this means to me is whether I get, you know, a cheap pass at the uh, swimming pool or, you know, that is that as leaders we are providing messaging to sort of allow for connecting that, that broader perspective. And, and I think that this is the moment in time when we're doing our official community plan, that we're putting this uh, information out to the public to get feedback, but also for education that we include these messaging, which is very important messaging, I believe. So thank you. I don't see any further speakers, so I will support this motion. And the reason I will support the motion um, because part of the donut economy is the, I mean, in simple terms, act locally, think globally. But if we don't have our global message in, in the, the simplicity of it, I think, and, and this is just my own personal opinion, 
the world is not necessarily a pretty place right now. And some of this, I think, could come from governments coming top down. And I look at our municipalities and our regional districts as voices that are nearest to the people on the ground. And that in order to really affect change that builds a better world, it might have to come from the ground up. It might be from municipalities that make change, that drive changes in other governments. So I will support this because I do think it's important for us to put out the message of always thinking globally. That's my two cents. I see no other speakers. Councillor Hemmings. Thank you, Chair. I'll be brief and I'll, I'll say that I'm not sure that um, putting two words into a, you know, the outer circle is, is getting us to where we want to go. I think the whole model is about where we want to go and we're doing that well. And I, I'm just finding it interesting that we're wordsmithing by motion two words. Um, yeah, so I, I feel like the model speaks very clearly to what we're trying to do. Um, and I, I hear Council Gesselbrock's passionate response to that and, and I, I'm, I'm still on the side that this whole concept is about thinking globally and acting locally and we should all be speaking that language and, and we probably, I don't know that we need um, formal motions about wordsmithing staff's, um, staff's interpretation of that. Thank you. Having said that, I will call the question. All those in favour? Okay. All those opposed? That makes it easier. Mayor Crow, Councillor Hemmings, Councillor Thorpe, Councillor Bonner, Councillor Turley, and Councillor Brown, you're for it? Yes. Okay. Motion is defeated. I don't think we have anything else on the agenda for today, Ms. Curry. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. So we did have a review of your bylaw project and policy review project that is in Council's strategic plan and is about governance excellence and all of that good stuff. However, I don't know if it would be good governance for us to go <laughs> on with that today. Um, so Ms. Robertson, who will be giving you the review, um, she, I did excuse her because the meeting was only set to go to five. So she will come back either on the 21st or at the next Governance and Priorities Committee meeting um, to go through um, the work that she has done and bring you up to date and possibly get a motion for you for some repealing of some very obsolete and old council policies. Thank so, you. Um, so not today. So it, it will be brought forward. Thank you. And I just want to say uh, thank you to everybody for the presentations. This will be the last Governance and Priorities Committee, I believe, I chair for this year. So I wanted to say this was great conversation today. I think we, we did a lot of work, and I want to thank all of you for your patience, and thank you, Council. So, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved by Council Hemmings, second by Mayor Krogh. All those in favor? Well, meeting is adjourned.